to inform the public of all relevant information. Information gathered is then referred back to planning and development staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to the planning committee. This means that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of the applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared making a recommendation for action to this committee. The recommendation is typically to approve with conditions or to deny. This committee then makes a recommendation on the applications to the City Council. City Council has the final say on the applications from the City's perspective. Following Council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council or the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local Planning Appeal Tribunal, but that person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, that person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. So I will call on our first public meeting, uh, which is uh, uh, for 49, Beverly, yeah, 49 Beverly Street. Well, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Committee, staff, and members of the public. My name is Mike Keane, and I'm a land use planner with Foten Consultants, and I'm here tonight to walk you through uh, a zoning bylaw amendment application for 49 Beverly Street. So this, this property is located in the Alwington neighborhood and it is just west of the main Queens campus. It's an area that is a, a mix of residential uses, uh, many owner occupied and rental units in the area Buildings in this community are commonly one to two and a half story uh, and also a couple of three story buildings in this area. And you can see by the map that, it's, that the central location of this site has good proximity to transit routes, uh, parks and open spaces, uh, as well as the university itself. The property as it exists today has a one and a half story dwelling on it. There are two units in the building and it's a fairly large lot of 551 square meters and 14 meters of frontage along Beverly Street. And this area of uh, Beverly Street is, is sloped as it heads down across to the east toward Collingwood. So there's over a three meter elevation difference from the front of this property to the back. So this is a conceptual plan for the proposal, uh, which would be to demolish the existing house and then to reconstruct a three unit residential dwelling. It would provide three parking spaces, one for each unit, and there would be common interior and exterior space and there would be a, an enclosed shed uh, to enclose bicycles. Now, when we, when we, and I say we, the Royal Re as FOTEN planners, when we're looking at applications like this and when people come to me to represent what I consider a minor infill application, there's a number of criteria that I, that I feel have to be met for these infill neighborhoods. So we start by looking at the parent zone on the property, which in this case is an A zone. It's a zone that allows one and two unit dwellings. And then there are provisions for height and setbacks, massing and lot coverage. So when we look at what kind of building might be appropriate on this site, that's our starting place. We're looking at those numbers in particular to try to determine what the box might look like that's appropriate for this site. 
And then there's the additional provisions such as parking and landscape, open space, amenity areas. And overall, contextually, does it complement the neighborhood? So the proposal that's before this committee tonight meets the provisions of the A zone with the exception of the fact that we're requesting three units instead of two. So to give you an example, the way the front yard setback works in the A zone, buildings are supposed to be brought in line with buildings on either side. Side yard setbacks are 0 0.6 meters, which is two feet, uh, and 3.6 meters in total between the two sides. So in this case, there's over three meters on one side and there's over two meters on the other. And the rear yard normally needs to be roughly seven and a half meters, and this would exceed that uh, quite significantly at 16 meters. So what's before the committee is a building in form that meets the provisions of the A zone. And this applies to both the original submission and the revised submission that we've been working on. So our original submission was a two-story dwelling with three units in it. Again, because of the grades, the basement unit has a walkout right at grade. So just to give you a side profile, this just gives you, you know, a rough idea of showing you how the lower unit uh, is, is quite significantly actually above the ground, like way more than 50%. But this is also an area, well, maybe before I get to that, just to give you an idea of floor plan layouts. They are three identical units. Everyone has access through the front door and everyone has access through the rear. They are four bedroom units uh, all down the driveway side. Now, what changed is uh, servicing constraints in the area. And Utilities Kingston does not recommend uh, basement units in the servicing constraint area. So as a result, we've added a floor to the building, but still within the provisions of the A zone. Um, so in terms of height and massing and setbacks and whatnot. So just to make folks familiar with this policy, uh, the, the city broadly has old pipes and it has combined sewers, meaning that sewer and stormwater run together. And so there's a policy in the official plan that talks about the types of, of, of uh, comfort levels that must be given to staff to ensure public health and safety is protected. So in reviewing an application such as the one before the committee, we have a civil engineer uh, look at the project. Uh, some of the improvements that happen with a new project are the fact that uh, stormwater connections are disconnected from the combined sewer. So what goes back into the pipe is much less, even though it's an additional unit. Houses like this would have a backflow preventer installed on them and the basement unit would be separate from the upper two units, which means that in the case of a black backflow issue where the, where the basement unit is literally locked off to prevent flooding, the upper two floors would actually still flush and, and not have issues with their, their systems. So it's a combination of technological advancement with uh, stormwater separation to make a project like this work. And then, uh, you know, basically comments that we've received from Utilities Kingston have led us to the revised submission. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're asking this committee for is a three unit building and uh, one that, that I would assure the committee would be within the A zone provisions and one that we would work with staff to ensure the design is satisfactory to them. So in terms of the official plan, this is a designated uh, residential area intended to accommodate a wide range of residential uses on full services. As I noted, it's, it's an A-zoned property which has specific provisions for one and two unit dwellings and it also acknowledges existing multiple family dwellings as being something that's permitted. I'm sure the folks that live in this area know better even than me how many existing multi-unit dwellings are in this area. So what, what we've come to do in recent years is, is there would have been a day where I would have asked this committee to do an A zone with a special provision to allow a third unit and not change any of the performance parameters. But in working with staff over the years, B 
because the city has a B zone, which is three to six units, staff have taken the position that we should zone for the use. So in this case, we ask for a B zone and then we address the setbacks to essentially more closely match the A zone provisions. So examples are the front yard setback, the side yard setback, because the way they're calculated is much different than the A zone. And we do typically ask for a reduction to the parking stall size, ultimately with the goal, goal of making a less paved area at the back of these homes. So in summary, uh, I come to the position that this application is consistent with provincial policy, consistent with the general intent of the official plan, and that it's compatible with the surrounding area. It's close to uses that would support a minor intensification use uh, such as this. And I'm pleased to entertain any questions the committee or the public has. Thank you. I'll turn to staff to uh, turn to information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pursuant to the requirements of the Planning Act, a notice of the statutory public meeting was provided in the form of signs posted on the subject property 20 days in advance of the public meeting. Notices were also sent by mail to all 70 property owners within 120 meters from the subject property. A notice was also placed in the Kingston Wig Standard on September 30th. Three pieces of correspondence were received and they are found in the addendum in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. I will now turn it open up for members of the committee if there are any questions. Uh, yes, Councillor Hutchison, then Councillor Chappelle. Thank you. Um, you said that um, that this is zone A, which is pretty straightforward, um, and your proposal meets A except for the setbacks. Was it? No, through you, Mr. Chair, the units. The, the number of units. Yeah, so the performance standards meet the A zone, but A zone only allows one and two family dwelling, whereas we're asking for three. Right, but you've also asked for uh, modifications on the B. So that, through you again, Mr. Chair, that's because the B zone parameters are different than the A zone. So effectively what I'm doing is taking the B zone, which allows three to six family dwelling, and making the provisions more in line with the A bylaw provisions. Yeah, this graphic, through you again, Mr. Chair, this graphic shows, um, See if I can get my mouse to move here. So you've got, you can see my mouse is moving. This is like an existing sidewalk in the right of way. So the street is just slightly beyond the bottom of my image. And then the property line is actually very close to the front of the existing houses in this area. You can see the, the box for the two existing houses on either side. And then you can see our house is slightly our house proposal is slightly behind the two existing houses with the front porch. And then the street is, yeah, roughly, you know, three, let's say another three meters out from the front property line. In the past, through you, Mr. Chair, in the past, most, mostly what we did was, when we did an application like this, was we did an A modification, so it would be allow the third unit. But as I discussed, what staff are encouraging us toward now is a B and then modify the provisions because of that B zone allowing the multi-family multi dwelling. But uh, when I was just looking before the public meeting, I can't say that there is specifically a, a 
be zoned property because it would have been a modification. The zoning bylaw from 1976 outright acknowledged the existing multifamily dwellings in this in this neighborhood. It honestly, through you, Mr. Chair, it's semantics. Like I, th I think you know, I could have just as easily written a zone that said a zone period, all the provisions apply, but we're requesting three units. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's just zoning politics in terms of the fact that a B zone allows three to six. So when you ask for a one and two to equal three, when you have something else that allows a three, that's why staff have encouraged us toward amending a different zone that allows the use rather than amending the use. So this is considerably bigger than the houses around it, correct? Well, right next door is a small apartment building with four units in it, right immediately next door. Okay. And it will be smaller than that building. Right. Um, I guess the question is, the big question here is compatibility yeah. with the streetscape. And so I think all my questions were directed at sort of trying to suss that out. Um, because that definitely jumped out at me. Um, so just a half a sec here. Okay, so what is the relationship between the um, number of units per net hectare for this building is versus the street in general? I don't know if I could answer that question directly, Mr. Chair. Um, what I can tell you is the form of the building, like literally this box could be built as a one or a one unit dwelling uh, in this shape. What I can tell you is that the density of this uh, proposal is not high. So therefore it doesn't have special parameters that have to be examined. And high starts at 75. So it's below that. True, but there wouldn't be too many places at 75 in a residential area in, in oh, Kingston. No, there, there are. No, I mean there are, but yeah. I'm saying how many there would be. The, um, okay. Um, I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Powell. Yes, sir, I have uh, three questions. The <clears throat> description of this property is family dwelling. Yet when you showed the floor plan, it had four bedrooms. Can you describe the family that will be living in those one of those floors? Certainly, I, I'm a good example of a family that could live on one of those floors. I have three children, and if I had a guest room, I'd actually probably want a fifth bedroom. So I think in an area like this, without a doubt, it has high potential for student rental, but it is also in close proximity to the hospital. You could be renting out to nurses, you could be renting out to families. It could be a, a wide range of people that would uh, be interested in a unit such as this. So. Okay. I'm not gonna comment any further on that because it's question time. So the, the next question is, uh, with regards to where the pavement is and the parking, it's for three spots, but you have four bedrooms per spot? Correct. Okay, for per unit, so you have 12 units and three rental, so, and then, so that's why you're complementing it with a, a bicycle shed? Well, the, uh, we're meeting the bylaw requirement of one parking space per unit. Yes, okay. The other question is, are any of those uh, parking spots uh, electrified for electrical vehicle? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I haven't taken the project to that level of detail. There's, there's no reason why they couldn't be. I, I mean, I don't know what the building code requires, but if the building code requires electrification, that, that would happen. But you know what doesn't require it. It's just perhaps a perspective that 
anyways, I the, I the other aspect of, is where would the recycling units be for your compost and waste recycling? Because often we see proposals of multi-residential units and there's really no regard for recycling. So through, through the plan that is the three-story plan where the basement is no longer being used as um, a unit, we have proposed storage, garbage storage, community room for the three units to use. Um, there's enough space that the bicycle shed could be expanded to contain uh, garbage for weekly as well. Like nothing is actually compressed here. There's lots of room to address items such as what you're raising. One supplement. Uh, in correspondence from residents in the neighborhood that, um, that suggests that this does not comply to the official plan of one, uh, one like two family units or two family dwelling units, and that in essence, by not complying to the, the plan and changing the zoning bylaw, the zoning to a different zoning, you end up here opening a rather precarious situation where other properties that are currently duplexed can be made in similar fashion. Is, is that a concern of FOTAN at all? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, that, that's an, an increment of the official plan. Uh, the zoning bylaw regulates number of units. While the official plan has detailed policies about uh, what is permitted within the residential designation, the residential designation could have everything from a single detached doubt, uh, house to a high-rise apartment. And so it's the compatibility test that goes through, which, which I've provided a detailed report for this application to review compatibility. Uh, as, as part of this application. So that's why what I, what I describe here as a small scale intensification project as opposed to you know, even a four or a six unit building or, or a small apartment. So the difference being that the official plan for the city of Kingston is new and the zoning bylaws do not comply with the official plan because they are so old. And that's a primary reason why this planning committee is as busy as it is, because people are applying for applications that conform to the official plan that do not conform to zoning bylaw without amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Sanic. For you, Mr. Chair, I have uh, four questions. So the house that's going to be built is going to be three units of four bedrooms each, so that's 12 bedrooms all together. The house that's there right now, how many bedrooms does it have? There's, I believe, two units with four each right now in that building. So just eight, eight, eight we're 12. increasing it to 12. That's our request. Okay, and then for at the house that's there right now, um, where's the parking? It looks like from the picture it's just to the side. Do they also park in the backyard? Because that's what we're proposing for yeah. this one, right? To have parking in the backyard. That's right. So through you, Mr. Right now, there's just a little gravel patch to park a car on, whereas we're proposing to get the, house, the cars down behind the building. So. So the car, like there's going to be three parking spots and the cars, like is that a really big slope? Are they going to have a problem getting out of the backyard in the winter time? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we had uh, assistance from Murray Jocelyn, civil engineer, who helped us with uh, the grading and the layout, the storm water and all these items. And so he has designed the grade to ensure that, 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 that those types of issues aren't going to be a problem. Um, but absolutely, I mean, it'll have to be kept clear and sanded for sure. And I have a question about, it looks like from the overhead photo that we have in our package, that there's some trees near the fence line of the backyard. Are yeah. those trees going to have to be cut down to accommodate this development? Through you, Mayor, I believe the trees along the fence line will not be impacted. The one tree that I am not, I can't say 100% won't be impacted is the pine tree that's on the front lawn. What I'm not clear is if that pine tree is on 49 or if it's on the adjacent 
uh, fourplex next door. Um, it's very close, so that is one tree that may be impacted. Thank you, and my last question is about the basement. So we know that the lower floor is going to be left as a common space for all units. You were just describing it. So I want to ensure that more students, or if it is students, right, or more people, we'll just call it people, that more people don't actually end up living down there, right, to try to cheapen the rent for everyone else. So will the floor be left as concrete, you know, to kind of keep it a cold environment to discourage yeah. any others from living down there? Yeah, yeah, I understand your concern. Uh, so, so through you, Mr. Chair, um, I mean, right now we have two, ex we actually have two examples of what could be proposed here pending further discussions with staff. So this, this two-story proposal would actually see the, the basement as that third unit. But as I mentioned, I don't know that, that, that I will be able to convince Utilities Kingston that a basement unit that has as much technically above grade as this still being okay. So the way the, the basement unit opens up, and I, I don't know if, if I have a floor plan of it, I'll just see if I do. Yes, so this, this is maybe slightly hard to see, but what, what you can see is that this, this basement unit is, basement unit, this basement is fully accessible to all of the units. And so we've got a large rec room proposed and a bathroom, but the other three spaces are storage lockers. So I don't know that I would want to agree to leave the, like the rec room space as like a concrete floor, because that might actually make it less enjoyable. But I, I think the, the, the the zoning that we're proposing would say um, three units, and this space is fully separate from those three units. So if those, if those were to be used illegally, the city would have the ability to address that from happening. Um, but it might be a compromise, as you've noted, where you, the storage spaces are left bare concrete, um, whereas the the rec room space is maybe, um, you know, has some floor treatment on it. And just so I understand that, so the rec room and the washroom, because maybe now I'm confused, the rec room and the washroom, they're not considered to be one of the three units, three units of four bedrooms for this development. That's correct. Okay. So when we lift, effectively lifted the building, turn the basement into common space shared by all three units. So all three units would have an independent storage unit. There would be a bathroom so that you don't have to go back to your um, unit upstairs to use the bathroom. And then this large area that goes front to back is, is the open space with the back being a rec room area. Thank you. I do have a concern that, you know, when it's all built and rented out, that still, like, someone, especially since a washroom is right there with the rec room, that some other people could sleep there and then see, you know, if, if they get caught, if they get away with it. Thank you. Sure. Th thank you. I appreciate your concerns, and I think staff are here, and I can work with staff to try to address that. Thank you. Um, since Vice, uh, Vice Chair Kylie isn't here, I'm going to deputize uh, Councillor Sanic, if I could, and if you could recognize. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. I too am am concerned about um, first of all the answer to do we have to electrify? I believe our OP. Talk, speaks to that in garage spaces. Uh, since this is an outdoor one, I don't think it speaks to that. But uh, given the climate crisis and the city's position on that, mm -hmm. I would be very pleased to see a commitment for one mm -hmm. outlet for, 
for an EV. So, and the other thing um, that I always encourage is um, permeable hard surface so that I know that we received at least one comment regarding concern about, about stormwater and the, the permeable surface would be a way of addressing that. So I'd be very pleased if that came, sure. if that commitment could be made. Uh, the, uh, the other question I had, and again, it's not a requirement for, for a three unit one, but do you have enough allowance so that at least one of those parking spaces could accommodate uh, a, a, uh, an, uh, uh, a parking space that could accommodate somebody with mobility issues. Mm -hmm. Is well, that a possibility? Yeah, so I'll try to tackle a few points. First of all, I was getting the thumbs up from my client on the electrification of a space. So, so I think that's not, uh, not going to be a problem. Um, I don't wanna make a commitment on the, the surface treatment. Um, but to your last point about the stall size being large enough for an accessible space, what you'll notice on the concept plan is that while we've drawn, drawn the spaces all at 5.2 by 6, the space closest to the house we have actually drawn as an accessible width uh, required space. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, unless the basement unit was the design where then we wouldn't really have an accessible unit because you have to go up some stairs, but it would still be somebody that didn't have full uh, mobility limitations uh, would be able to take advantage of this space and at least be guaranteed a close space to the house. Thank you. Um, seeing no for, yes, Councillor Chappelle. Following up on uh, Councillor Osanek's comments with regards to the floor plan of the basement that has a common room, since it's being proposed as more for storage and some common utility space, you know, if, and, and the concerns that the floor plan is almost identical with the exception of a lack of a kitchen and closets, would it be amenable to the proponent to remove the bathroom? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, I can bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the main reason that the floor plans are unified like this is just the structure, like where the beams are in the building, but but certainly uh, the, the bathroom is not required. It just, if you're on the third floor and you're coming down to watch a movie with your buddies. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I think that's something I'd be willing to entertain with staff and discuss for sure. You certainly may. I'd like to ask a question of staff. Um, assuming it was, it went ahead and, and at some point that basement ended up becoming residential area, what would be the outcome of, of a penalty or re re remediation for having illegal apartments in that condition, and in that location? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that. We would uh, need to again review that with a Utilities Kingston to see if um, it would be appropriate to even allow for a residential unit there in the basement. To clarify, with the assumption that no dwelling units are permitted on the basement floor, which is why there's a height request for a third uh, height, assuming that there's no permission, what would be the ramification if that location of the basement was turned into plum uh, dwelling units illegally? What would the city's uh, role be as far as enforcement or fines or what have you? What is the remediation process? Mm -hmm. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the city does have the ability to bring charges against um, any properties that are not in compliance with the zoning bylaw. Um, and that's something that we can do when we do have illegal habitation. Oh, I, I can't tell you the exact amount, but I know I know that the charges are filed through the court and there is a, a fine associated. Yes, that would that is another option that the city has to bring orders to remove um, remove fixtures and that kind of thing if they're if they're there. 
Yeah. Thank you. That tweaked a question for me, so if uh, Councillor Osanek could take over the chair. That's good. I take the chair, Rick. Thank you. I guess my only con uh, concern is by going to B zone, that allows three to six. Now, uh, are we, is there the potential then in future for them to come back and request, uh, because it is fairly good size background, a backyard, to come back and ask for a fourth unit to be added on the assumption that this is a B zone and it allows up to six. So is this a slippery slope? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if, if they were to come back in future, uh, say, to propose a fourth unit, they'd have to go through a resubmission again. We would review it. We'd go through the whole review again, looking to see if it was in character and keeping with the surrounding uses in the neighbourhood. Um, if most of the uses in the neighbourhood are one and two units, then putting a fourth unit in is starting to not be with the neighbourhood fabric and the, the uh, makeup of the neighbourhood. So we would have to have a much closer look at it. So I wouldn't say it would be a fait accompli. That'd be a, a pretty hard pitch, I think, to mm. convince us. Through you, Madam Chair, before you pass chair back, just to, to assist staff, this slide on the screen shows what we're requesting and we're asking for a triplex. We're not asking for a three to six unit dwelling in this application. So as the, as, uh, the manager of planning noted, it, it would be a, another application if we were increasing units further. I appreciate that, I guess. And there have been issues in Williamsville regarding um, and I believe, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm trying to meet with the director of planning regarding this, uh, but sometimes we have illegal units that are identified by bylaw, and the, the owner puts in an application to, for a zoning amendment to legalize what is illegal, but then they don't do anything with it for four or five years, but continue to rent out all of the units during that time, even though it's in non-compliance. I'm looking for a way to possibly adjust that so that abuse can't continue to happen. But is there potential for that happening here? Could somebody indeed, regardless of what the public utility says, could they use the basement for living space and then just come back and say, we'll, we'll apply for a, a zoning change and then drag it out for a number of years? Thank you, you Mr. Chair. I think that speaks more to our, our our internal processes for enforcement than anything else. I think the, the issue that you've brought up is something that we're internally trying to deal with right now and something that we've noted. Um, so I definitely think that that is something that in future we can, we can ensure that it doesn't happen. Um, but I also just wanna note that anyone can apply for anything at any time and people can also do illegal things at any time. So I think it's, it's more the responsibility of the city to make sure that we have strong enforcement policies and processes to prevent that from continuing. I looked to you tweak because I've got a moaning around in my head. So thank you, Councillor Chappelle. Yes, you Mr. Chair, while you're still there, if the issue from from utilities Kingston is that that below grade or the grade level for for, for um, sewer and water is an issue, what about building it so that it's not inhabit like you can't inhabit? So like have like a crawl space site of four feet is your basement. Through you, Mr. Chair, I mean that's maybe something like literally create a space below the basement. You know these are options that we can certainly explore with staff in terms of, you know, working on the form of, of what's, what we're trying to seek for approval. Yeah, I, I think what you're sensing from uh, members of, of the committee is that there is a reluctance to 
encourage more student use in an area and change the, the fabric of that community? Like it's, it's I understand we have crisis, hey, but it's- Excuse me, I'm gonna bring up a point of order myself. Sure. We can speak to land use planning. We can speak to tenancy. There's a human issue when we start talking about students. So, thank you. <laughs> So, seeing no other questions, we'll now open it up to the public. Uh, there's a microphone uh, at this side and another one at this side. If you care to just step up to a microphone, identify yourself, uh, name and address, and you have five minutes uh, to make comments or ask questions. The questions will be collected uh, and will be all answered at the end not at the time that they're asked, okay? So, yes, recognizing the gentleman behind me. Hello, okay. Good evening, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Peter Rubens and I live at the corner of Collingwood and King Street. I'm in opposition to this proposed development. The property owner developer is asking for relief for a number, a vast number of standards. And these include the increases of the minimum side yard, aggregate setbacks, in particular the front yard, and parking relief. In addition, a request is made to rezone the property to permit a triplex. Under the current official plan, the area is zoned A for one and two family dwellings, period. What is requested here is almost completely at odds with the surrounding properties. There are no three and a half story buildings in the immediate vicinity, and only one three story home much further north on Beverly Street. The proposed building shares no common design elements with any of the surrounding buildings, save but one. Hence, this structure is immediately out of place with regards to virtually all the surrounding build forms. It doesn't fit. When I requested documentation on the design of the structure, I was given a side view of a two and a half story with bedrooms on each floor, which we've seen tonight. A total of 12 bedrooms. It didn't correspond to the street view and plans, which showed three floors and a basement. And I questioned this and was told I got the wrong side view. When I was presented the corrected side view, the building had increased by an additional floor. Again, as we've seen, it had morphed from a two and a half story building to a three and a half story building. This was contrary to the engineering service report, which clearly indicated that the dwelling, quote, will consist of a new two and a half story structure. This extra floor contained additional bedrooms. Examining the floor plan showed that the basement with four bedrooms was now a, quote, storage area with three storage rooms. A recreation room, bathroom, and furnace, virtually identical to the other floors, but without a kitchen. Now, with the demand for apartments and permission to construct secondary suites, it's obvious that this could easily increase the bedroom accommodation to 15 simply by adding a kitchen. No other building anywhere in the neighborhood of moderately sized family homes has designed features which could accommodate this many people on this many floors. This new building is just under twice the footprint of the previous building, but the lot literally bulges with the scope of the project. For example, there is minimal parking of three spaces, relief requested, inadequate given the number of individuals who may have vehicles. Permit parking is available, but will put additional demand on street parking. Everyone is well aware of the parking issues surrounding nearby Breakwater Park. This will easily overload an already strained parking situation. And the additional vehicular traffic on an already busy street simply adds to the increase in noise and pollution and danger to residents. My home is located in one of the lowest elevations in the city, which has resulted in many flooded buildings. This is abated to a degree due to the CSO tank. However, basements are in constant danger of flooding and many neighbors have sumps running continuously. I am regularly just a few inches from a catastrophic flood. Now this is due in large measure to groundwater movement. Much of the flow is concentrated in the center of the block and is intercepted by catch basins. With less water infiltration on this particular site as a result of this overbuild means that the catch basin will drain greater amounts of water into a combined sewer system. The system is prone to backing up, surcharging, flooding basements. 
It's not unreasonable to assume that a development of this scope with additional surface runoff and added sanitary loading into the existing CS system might well tip the balance of flood control against my home and my neighbors. And what about the remaining groundwater movement with record high water levels in Lake Ontario and climate change? Projects such as this will dramatically affect us. It was noted by Utilities Kingston that there is a, quote, high susceptibility to flooding, end of quote, at this site. 30 seconds? And, yes. And while they don't recommend units in this development, it is only a recommendation. This may account for the extra floor. However, this site is at a higher elevation and is much less prone to flooding. Why shouldn't two and a half stories be good enough for the proposed building? It will reduce the number of floors, ensure few, fewer bathrooms, or bedrooms, excuse me, reduce the load on the CS system. And if potential flooding is an issue, they're forced to use mitigating measures, it would mean that this building would be on par with measures the rest of us have to live with. In conclusion, the build form doesn't fit with the existing community, particularly those adjacent single-story buildings. It has more floors than other buildings in the neighborhood. The Sorry, room. Yes, um, could I just say one last thing? Very quick. Finally, I would like to note a single story building for sale beside 49 Early and another across the street. If this proposal goes ahead as designed, there will be tremendous pressure to develop these sites in lockstep. The could I ask you to just submit Sorry. that and that'll yep, go into the official that. record? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so if there's another person, I'll go to this side who would like to make a comment at this microphone. Seeing none, I'll go, go behind me again. Head, Don. My name is uh, Donald Mitchell at 43 Gibson Avenue, but I'm uh, here tonight on behalf of the SDA who were also contacted about um, this particular um, application. So. Uh, I tapped in about five years ago and really started to read a lot about this and study a lot about this and come to a lot of meetings. Um, and I think that the majority, so what I'd like to speak to mostly is what the community kind of feels when an application like this comes forward. Um, and you get, an, you get a, a wide variety of reactions. But in general, I think we all finally get that the provincial policy statement, you know, says we need to intensify and that there needs to be more density coming. Um, my concern with this, I think above everything else, is location. And so I just want to speak to some of that through a lot of uh, things that we've witnessed going on. So the provincial policy statement's designed for an entire province, and it says basically we should grow. I agree with that, but I think Kingston should have very unique things that say how Kingston should grow. And we've been developing a lot of those, and I'm going to jump ahead to a note that I would make later, but I think that the public should have issue and concern with the timelines of the development of policy in this city. So where we have zoning bylaws that are active projects for four or five years now, where we have the official plan that took years to get done, I think the public is being told one story about how we're going to grow, and yet I think a 1940s zoning bylaw that was last updated in the 70s isn't actually doing what we need. And so I want to signal that I think a lot of the public problem with these development applications is because we haven't got that stuff updated. So the official plan, I think, speaks to many things. Compatibility, stability, character areas, all of that's in there. I think you'll even find that there's the early indications now of nodes and corridors. There is a study that's actually a schedule that's acknowledged in one, or that is acknowledged in one of the schedules that is for the near campus area, which they widened, where the original focus was north, and now it's spread east to west from St. Lawrence College all the way over to Barrie. And so I, I think this is what the public hears. And so we've had these studies and these plans. We have the Central Kingston Growth and Infill Strategy. I could show you these pages, but where they indicate we're going to see this kind of intensification is not in the middle of a block on a street like Beverly Street. There are very clear indications forming of where we should put buildings like this, and it's why you see buildings like this on Johnson Street. Or you might see them on Brock and not in the middle of a neighborhood, which I think all of our policy and our developing policy says we shouldn't be doing. Um, so. Moving on to clear direction, I think that's one of the problems with this. There isn't clear direction. I work for a very large church, and we're a B zoning. And it gives us the ability to do additional uses. 
I was at a, a meeting here a couple years ago where a building downtown was changed to a B zoning so it could do things like bed and breakfast, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I think that um, like a small inn. And so I think the B zoning is wrong. I, and and I, that's the problem I have with this. And I might have a different opinion if this was fronted on a major corridor or at a node where we had indications that that's what we want to do. Parking, I'll tell you what happens with parking with a single unit. Right next door, love the people, have anywhere from three to five cars, have an identical driveway to what you're proposing, and guess what happens when somebody wants to get their car out? It fills the neighborhood. So the parking issue is going to be real no matter how you design that parking, because the reality is even a single unit can have three to five cars. So I have concerns with the parking. The projection in the front yard concerns me because we've seen on Johnson Street that then the impacts of the facility... 30 seconds. That's awesome, thanks. They, they spill out in yard. I have a little concern with the side yard being reduced because if you're going to go up higher, I think that that's a relationship thing. So if you're going closer to the lot lines, I feel for the properties on either side. Uh, the final thing I'll say is I think it should have site plan control especially hearing some of the comments that were made up tonight. And so I think that staff should be asking to have some control on where garbage and parking and different things happen. Um, and that uh, it would be nice if there was a unit at grade, which would allow it to be an accessible unit someday. In general though, I think we have to start going this direction. And I think this intensification is good. And I think the people who are doing this should be commended, even at the number of units, it's just, I think the public is being told that these types of structures would be located in other areas. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And again, if you have any written submission, feel free to leave it with the clerk before the evening. Uh, anybody else seeing none? Oh, this lady right here. Uh, yep, uh, and just push the button so the little red light goes on. Can you hear me now? Or, no, I've got to move it over. Okay, good. Um, my uh, representation is really um, I'm in, I'm live on. Could, I'm sorry. Could we have your name and address, please? It's, my name is Eileen Dixon, and I'm Twenty Beverly Street, and I've lived there for twenty years. So my submission is very personal, and um, it's been a pleasure living in that area. There's always been students on the street. I enjoy their youthfulness, the diversity, and other renters too. Um, and it's been a lively street. However, I believe we're at a tipping point in that street, especially this lower section of the street, where any increase in the sort of rented, and it, let's face it, the truth is, predominantly student population, will just change the street to be a student street. It has been a single family dwellings, it's a lovely place to live, I feel very grateful for that. But it's becoming a primarily student area. And again, I'm sorry to, but... Talk about rental, you want me to say th rental? There's, there's, a, there's an honesty in yeah, this, but you want to... There's a human rights decision yes. that says we cannot okay. uh, plan according to tenancy. The, I, I understand so. that, but as, as, an, as a neighbor, as a person who lives in this area, that's fine. There's a reality. I think you got your point in, but it's okay. my business to ask yeah. you not to t speak okay. about students. Okay. And, and I speak. My point of this actually follows from the other persons that perhaps this is part of the city plan, that the nature of the street is being allowed to change, and perhaps that's a definite plan. I think for the res people who already live there, the people who are in the single families. Um, we need to know if this is going to be a direction that the city's going to take, um, because it, 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 we, sh we should know that sort of going forward. We're already losing sleep in the summertime from the noise in the middle of the night visitors to the beautiful and highly successful Breakwater Park. But you have to know, people arrive at the beach at midnight, and they often don't leave until three or four o'clock in the morning, and they're only there for a few minutes. You might say, call the police, they'll be gone by then but they'll have had their car radio on full blast, opening the door and closing that. And students can be the same way. Our current students, our current renters, neighborhood renters are very quiet, <laughs> right? The euphemism, very quiet and they're good. It's a I would hate to have to rule you out of order and turn the mic off. Please do not talk about students. I, I've corrected myself, I did correct myself. Yeah. Please do not talk about students. Thank you.
It's a lovely stray neighbors, and so far we've been able to tolerate these nuisances. But in conclusion, we don't want the proposed de development there. We don't want any further density of population in that street. People have talked about the parking. It's horrendous. My driveway's blocked a lot of the time. And um, it's, it's really becoming, you know, an, an unfavorable place to live in from a neighborhood perspective because of the density of the population and because of the beach, which I don't believe the, the, was taken into account, the parking issues when that beautiful place that, I mean, its success was probably not anticipated, and it's great, it's been successful, but there's problems for that for the neighbors around. Thank you very much. And sorry for sorry interruptions. Oh, that's fine. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Uh, Frank Dixon, 495 Alfred, apartment two, K7K, 4J1. So I do not live in the immediate neighborhood, but I did live for a number of years up the street by one block, just above Queens Crescent on Beverly. So I do know the neighborhood, and it is really a sweet area, no question about it. So I want to get on to a different topic than has been discussed so far. Um, this is a mature neighborhood, and we haven't heard anything about some of the nice aspects of the dwelling that's currently there in terms of what year was it built, um, any heritage uh, aspects of interest. We didn't hear about that, so I'd like to, I'd like to learn more, more about that. Um, I'm opposing the project as it's proposed tonight. Is I'm considering it as an overbuild in the middle of a block on what is normally a quiet street. I don't think that's appropriate for the neighborhood. And I've got an alternative proposal which would see the current house retained and expanded with one and a half floors as it is, and perhaps going a little bit further back into the backyard than is currently proposed. But that retains um, the materials that are already there, I am surprised to hear from the planner that there are apparently already eight bedrooms in the house as it is, because it's only one and a half stories. So is there currently residential in the basement of the unit? Haven't heard about that yet. And the reason I'm raising this point is because I lived in a three-story house with a basement that had eight bedrooms in it. Okay, basement was for storage, one basement, one room on the ground floor, four on the second floor, three on the third floor. And that house is still there. I got a mind's eye picture of it. This house seems to be a lot smaller. So I'm surprised to hear there's eight bedrooms there. Um, so that's my uh, submission. Um, I just don't think it's the right, I right idea in that location. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if this gentleman wants to move to a mic, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank, um, I'm Rob Kennedy, and I live at 20 Beverly Street, just uh, a few houses down. And yes, I'm, I'm very concerned that uh, our street um, Mr. Keene, I think you said you didn't have an exact census, and I don't, but like, I would say roughly now my guess would be that it's half single-family dwellings. Um, and it's definitely, in the 20 years that we've been there, it's undergoing a change. And uh, I won't mention the S word, um, but many houses have been uh, changed to the, where they don't have a dining room anymore. They have just a series of, of rooms, of bedrooms, uh, to maximize the uh, number of, of uh, people, of rental units that, that can be in there. So we're undergoing that change. Um, I'd say that a lot of our neighbors um, have come to meetings like this, uh, again, uh, whether it was a spot zoning application like this, which I think is, at least, is honest, that's good in a way, or just a, a minor a variance application, which is, uh, but they've come to the meetings and, and they've lost, and so they've kind of lost heart, and they just 
just won't come anymore. Um, but I'd like to ask the planning staff, um, my limited knowledge of planning, uh, I've always heard, oh, spot zoning is a bad thing. That's what you don't do. Um, and I guess um, Mr. Keene referred to the next door building, which is a, a four unit little uh, cube um, apartment. And I, you, know, you can observe that that unit, the existence of that unit, which would have been um, brought through a process like this of exception, that unit is now an argument for the permissibility of more units along that way. I mean, this one's only three, it's not four. So thin into the wedge. Um, if this is, uh, as, and I really appreciated the gentleman who was talking about the having a unified policy for densification and for infill, you know, and uh, um, if this is permissible, why not, if, if there's 100 properties on Beverly Street, uh, is it permissible for this one? Is it permissible for the other 99? If people come tomorrow, next month, whatever, um, the, the number of properties for sale has been mentioned. Um, so I guess that, that, that's our, our, our question, our fear, is that we kind of see ourselves as being at a tipping point where it's a fantastic uh, neighborhood street where there's... Uh, uh, um, every year, there, there's a there's a block block party in June, and uh, people know each other well and and support each other. Um, and uh, my wife uh, tried to allude to the, the the different populations there. We're we're all in favor of diversity, and we enjoy that that part of the street too. But we are fearful that this is another step towards no diversity towards just one kind of uh, one kind of dwelling on the on the street so I guess my biggest question is um, if you spot zone this why wouldn't you spot zone another one tomorrow and another one the day after and so on or, or uh, could there be a more if, if there's a desire, uh, we, which I think we all agree, densification is probably desirable, is there a better way to do it? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, oh, there's one, one more person on this side, and uh, if you could just wave at me if you haven't spoken and you'd like to. I can, uh, excellent, uh, the floor is yours. Just push the button. You okay. I'm Sandy Wood. I live at 50. I grew up there. I have returned to live there. I vehemently oppose this proposal. I echo the much more eloquent statements of my predecessors this evening. I do not, I support intensification. It's a wonderful neighborhood but I vehemently oppose moving from a zone A to a zone B. I echo that it is zone A with, mod with moderation. Um, I echo the concerns about parking, especially with the success of Breakwater Park. Um, I, I see the street parking issues. We get no enforcement, even after repeated calls. So the city is not meeting there. They can say we will have, Enforcement, it's not coming through. I could tell you about a red Jeep that's on our street every day, and it avoids parking at Queens. Um, it, there's no enforcement, so we need to get it right from the get-go at the um, permitting stage. So I, I, all I can say is a structure of this height and this magnitude with all of these exemptions on front yard, side yard, backyard, does not, I challenge everyone in this room, including the consultant and the proponent, to demonstrate to me how this at all fits with our, or complements our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no other speakers, I'll turn to uh, the proponent, planner, and staff to address those questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, 
um, and I will I will touch on as many. I'm sure that there will be some follow up in writing, uh, particularly uh, for Mr. Rubin's submission, which which we didn't get to hear all of. But uh, one thing I want to touch touch on again, which we talked about earlier in the meeting, was the understanding between the official plan and the zoning bylaw. And, and it, was, it was brought to the room's attention that this didn't comply with the official plan, the A zone of the official plan. And I just want to provide clarity that the official plan doesn't have zoning. The official plan has a residential designation. Within that residential designation, a wide range of residential uses are permitted. And there are compatibility tests as to where low, medium, and high density uses are appropriate. And part of my job uh, as a land use planner is to review that uh, material. And a planning report was submitted with this application that you can, you can download from DASH and, uh, and review my opinion in detail. Uh, and, and that kind of echoes some of the points about the fact that this is a intensification in the middle of the block. Again, it's, it's all about compatibility and scale and uh, when we were reviewing the application, that's, that's also why I had a slide about the types of parameters that I give to my clients when they're proposing infill in, in well-established neighborhoods, mid-block, whatever it might be. And while I have on the screen the B zone changes that we are seeking, what, what I'd also noted in my presentation was that the building, whether, whether the two-story or the three-story, uh, as proposed, it meets the A zone. So if a building permit was applied for that was a single unit in the shape that, that, uh, that is on the screen or was on the screen, that meets the A zone. So when we change it to the B zone simply to recognize three uses, there were other provisions that we effectively tighten up to control the built form. So you can see how, how as was discussed by, by one of um, the members of the public, the B zone permits a wide range of uses, uh, which is, but what we're asking for is a triplex dwelling. We're not asking for the full list of uses. The front yard setback, which we're requesting a setback of three meters, is actually a greater distance than what the A zone permits. So it's further away than what the A zone would allow. The side yard, you can see the numbers on the screen, 3.2 and 2.1 meters respectively. The A zone requires 0 0.6 and the two added together to equal 3.6. So you can see how these side yards are exceeding what that built form of an A zone would require. Amendments to parking stall size is, is a standard request that, that our firm has made for probably seven or eight years at this point. And the projection into the yard, again, is to deal, deal with a porch. And again, it's just, it, it's a semantic distinction between an A and a B zone. What I am hearing loud and clear and, and what I've been discussing with staff is, is the need to ensure that the, the house as proposed is, is a form that uh, will blend in the neighborhood. So, so we're discussing how to deal with some type of, of compromise between the two-story and the three-story building so that the third unit is built maybe more into the roof line um, while we're striking that balance of not being able to have the, uh, the basement unit uh, because of uh, flooding or risk of, of pipes backing up is really what it is. Um, but to the point about flooding, the, the new build will actually separate and will not be allowed to reconnect stormwater to the sewer. So, there, so the new build should actually improve the situation, although I suspect that this scale, it's, it's minute. There were comments raised about uh, the existing house. Uh, certainly from the street, it appears to be a small house, but when you look at aerial photography, it's, there have been additions and, and it's, it's probably bigger than what you realize, even though it's a one and a half 
uh, story dwelling. Uh, we did consider uh, building a further addition or removal part of the house and building a further addition, but the, uh, the structural integrity of the house is not great. And uh, as a result, it makes more sense uh, to reconstruct the entire dwelling. But I, but I will share that was a consideration. And, you know, I, overall, our goal, um, you know, while it is certainly uh, a, a rental proposal that we are proposing, is, is to create something that fits into the neighborhood. Uh, it is something that will provide 100% of its required parking and uh, would provide a nice yard for people. And, uh, and I think that, that broadly touches on the themes that were brought up. Um, but uh, if the committee has any further questions, I'm pleased to assist. Thank you. Um, do staff want to address any of those questions? The one that kind of flagged for me was the concern about uh, about spot zoning. And I know we get a lot of spot zoning because we have a lot of really old bylaws. Uh, per perhaps you could address, uh, somebody could address that issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, th in the city, we do seem to have a, a strong practice of doing site-specific zones. Um, and that's something that we're looking at trying to get away from, um, including in the new the new comprehensive zoning bylaw. Um, to Mr. Keene's point, I think we do see a lot of requests for relief from the current zoning because it is out of date. Um, the I guess that's the zoning piece. On the kind of the idea of the 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 incremental change that you can see across the neighborhood when people are, are continually asking for, for kind of exceptions. Um, that's something that we are currently trying to, well, we, that we are currently dealing with through a number of secondary planning exercises. So the, the central Kingston growth strategy is one that is going to establish sort of increased direction for how that we will intensify within specific neighborhoods um, to try to avoid that sort of incremental change, we want there to be a clearer vision for how that happens. Thank you. Thank you. See, I'll go back to the committee. Are there any questions that have been tweaked? The, the next uh, public meeting is regarding this property as well, and just the move, movement from an A zone to a B zone. So if it's related to that zoning shift, We'll be addressing that in a couple of minutes. If it's anything to do with this portion of the proposal, now would be the time to ask the questions. So, yes. I'm going to take this into a question, but I'll try. I'm a bit concerned by the way in which the report addresses this. It's not unlike the other reports, but it talks about the applicable policies in this, I'm, I'm wondering, like in this case, I'm wondering where is the public interest? How, the question is, is this compatible to the neighborhood that exists? That, and you've heard from the public and some cogent arguments there. Uh, the argument is essentially, well, it's like what we've done before. That, but that's, as you know, irrelevant, because first of all, should it have been done? And what is, the, what is the upshot? But the important thing I'm trying to get at here is you're citing the, PP, the provincial policy statement. It talks about promoting efficient development and land use patterns. My main point on every one of these points you've got there is this neighborhood already makes it. They already fulfill the requirements. Sydenham District has averages about, is about 73 units per hectare. I know this because I had senior staff do this up, okay? In your bylaws thing, it says 69, but we're not gonna quibble about that, okay? It's more, more you know. My point is, in the downtown area, but in this area in particular, we are already achieving the kind of densities we need for efficient use of infrastructure and transit. 
and 37 per units per hectare. Uh, net hectare is the, the standard for transit. It probably should be higher, but never mind. That's the standard. Okay, so accommodate appropriate range and mix of residential uh, units, so on. This neighborhood makes that already before this or any other thing that follows. The avoiding development land use patterns would cause environmental, public health, and safety concerns. That's a separate one, and that was raised by a gentleman over here. So when you're looking at the comprehensive, then you really have to look at that. What can this neighborhood uh, establish? So I'm sorry, this is just one long question, okay? <laughs> Avoiding um, land use, blah, blah, blah. Promoting cost-effective development patterns. My argument would be it's already there. So why do you need this? You should be in some other neighborhood, or as was argued by another public member, should have been on a corner, should have been on an arterial, should have been, frankly, some, some other place where the densities are a third, less than a third, a quarter of what we're finding in the downtown, okay? So um, land use centers shall be based on densities and mix of land uses which are appropriate for and efficiently used and avoid the need for their unjustified and uneconomical expansion this is an expansion. How does that fit there? Um, properties for testification development where it can be accommodated, taking into account existing building stock or areas. That comes up with context and compatibility and other parts of the OP. And, and it doesn't seem to make it. Its footprint was claimed, and perhaps you can straighten me out on this, to be just minimal, like two and a half times. When you look at the street picture, which Councillor um, Chappelle showed me, it's a little apartment building. It's, I mean, it's not as big as a house, okay? <laughs> Some houses. So when we, if we were going to justify this, none of this applies. You've already, we've already achieved this. This is like the neighborhood that's always touted in English Canada, as being the most efficient in terms of density and so on is Riverdale or Cabbage Town. Okay? Well, this is what you got. It looks almost the same. So it bothers me, okay, that people have to fight like dogs to stop the destruction of neighborhoods that are already ultra efficient. And that, it seems to me, should be the argument we're giving. And so, I, I'm, I'm just asking. I know why people want to do this. They want to make money. If somebody said in here, and I, I already had the same opinion, obviously. I didn't come up with this this afternoon. You know, um, making money is not a good enough excuse. So, okay. so the... the the question is, the question is, how can we apply these? Like, how are you going to be able to come forward and say, we, this happens over and over again, we are doing this because of these reasons? No, you're not. You already got it. Which, Thank you. Okay. I would like staff to put a question mark behind every one of those comments and try to address them if you would. Thank you very much. Uh, through Mr. Chair, I'll report back to you next year. Um, no, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, in answer to the, the question, um, I think maybe the best way to address it is um, any property owner has the right to make a submission to change the zoning in the official plan. That's what they've done here. Because they've done that, what this report is, the public meeting report, is summarizing the application that has, has been submitted to the city. And then the context of the report are the measurement tools, if you will, that we as planning staff will measure those against. That and the questions that were raised by the public as well as the councillors this evening. When we come back with a comprehensive report, after further discussions with the applicant and trying to address the questions and concerns that were raised, the comprehensive report comes back and addresses the proposal in detail against those policies. 
Um, so when you're stating that the neighborhood already fits this, you're absolutely correct, it does. What we have to do is assess if this ask to make an addition into the neighborhood still fits. Thank you. Um, I don't. I believe all of the que questions asked so far have been addressed. Uh, any other questions? If not, I'll ask or deputized. Uh, I take the. Thank you. So this, in its entirety, I misspoke a minute ago, comes back as a comprehensive report. One of a couple of things I'll be looking for within that comprehensive report. Um, with all due respect to the proponent and the planner, there seems to be, we're going B zone, and I'm not totally clear on why, but then when it doesn't meet a number of the criteria for a B zone, we're being told, it's okay, we can apply A zone parameters, because the A zone would have allowed us to do that. So I guess, I'm, I'm, I would be looking for in the comprehensive report a really clear rationale for why it has to be a B zone. And then, uh, and the chart that was provided here, normally our planners give us, which is what the zoning calls for and what the variance requested is, uh, I'd like a clear rationale that supports all of those variances that are being requested. Um, I'm sure that would have come anyway, but those are the questions that are, I think came up out of this meeting that need to be answered clearly. Uh, and whether that's an answer uh, to a yes recommendation or a no recommendation, it needs, uh, that information will need to be there, okay? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, the comprehensive report, when it comes back, will address those issues in the clearest manner possible. I appreciate that Thank much. So I now declare this meeting closed, and we will move on to uh, 60 Collingwood Street. Mr. Chair, can we just have a bio break for a second? Yes, we're going to take a tap dance and break for three minutes. And I'm going to grab a coffee. But the point is, you know what the problem with the density in on Tanner Drive? No. Okay. Uh, oh, well, Tanner. It's in North Harvest. Yeah. They should allow for small apartment buildings of four, six, eight, ten mm -hmm. stories, mm -hmm. and then soak up some of that. Yeah. 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 Density. Yeah. It's 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 worse than the one in my neighborhood. Oh, Tanner Drive. Oh. Yeah. How do you know Tanner Drive? Something. Yeah, you know, someone who lives there. Oh, okay. Just add a quick you were, address. You were very indulgent. <laughs> so you were going. <laughs> well, my question, my question is, could you okay. comment? Uh, are you allowed? That's a question. <laughs> 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 very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, 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 and thank you, because I, I, I think you decided to. Oh, sorry, to, no, it's okay. I knew you. I knew, and you know, when I was looking at this, I, this guy's from Toronto. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Well, you see, here's my position for the They've asked for an A, a B, a B. They can just say no. But, but I, go find a natural guy. You know? Which, which is the step that would work. Or like, if you Yeah, you know, if, it, if you meet the density. That's that's only twice. Yeah, I know, I know. But if you make it twice, the thing. Yeah. No, no, I Something can. good is already happening. Um, I, 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 I,
The most powerful tool is exactly what the is looking at here. Mm -hmm. This is what I do when I get an application. I <coughs> just go up and down the street and go mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. and, well, well, I know the street. I, yeah, I thought, yeah. Colin, yeah, Colin is went a little bit different. Slightly different. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit yet. Mm -hmm. it, it's, which is hard to believe, actually. Well, because mm -hmm. it, it stays. Purposeful stuff is not going to change it. It's happening in my district. I'm in New York. Okay, so yeah. Right? I now find students in the last election, not the one that happened last year, but before, on Russell Street. Used to never find hmm. the housing stuff. Yeah, for everybody. And, and, and of course, with the transit, the idea was to thin the map. Yes, you pull, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, there's no footprint change on this one, right? It's just kind of a making it legal after maybe a non compliance for a number of times, or you're just kind of regularizing it. Is it what you're doing, right? In fact, that's exactly right. It's legalizing the existing one and bringing it into compliance. So, for example, you might have parking. Yeah, that's where you Yeah, I have no objections to that. So, sorry. Probably if. Unless you guys fairly routine. Well, exactly. So the um, is the first time twice as, as as compared to the previous one, right? Which is quite, uh, well, it's quite different. Right? Even though it's in the same neighborhood, right? It's basically like one block away. Well, yeah. If you look at the little houses we have, it's very similar. The apartment situation is different. Right. Okay. But that's like half the street. It's a two-story with all the kids. Yeah, and and it's. So, it, it, it's, it's nice. so we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll work Relative to the I, I, trust me, we'll be working on it. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So, but I, I really do want what I brought up. Like, if you come back and say, I'm not going to be happy, if you come back and tell me, oh, we're doing this, we're allowing this because of it's still the PPS. Where's the public oh, interest? But we're mandated to do this. But you can say no. Well, you know, you can say well, this is the least. This is an arguable fact, you know, that this really doesn't uh, fulfill the intent of this. Because the PPS is looking for efficiency, but if you've already got it, that's really the other So I guess so. Yeah, so if they back to the two story process. No, 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 I knew that. I knew that. I just knew there wasn't that massive. Oh, no, no. no. And this, that is a design that And it's a type of design. It's that it doesn't No, trust me. No, actually. Sorry, sorry. I don't. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. This is, this is frustration coming from no, no, no. 10 years ago. This is to do. It's one of the reasons I got on. It's It's because, I mean, people are trying. It just wasn't. You know, the Brazilian control, sort of control. Thanks, bud. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm on the edge for the worst dog. Uh, this is why you need to like now start to think about a new one. That's callous. No, it's not callous. It's not. It's not. Maybe cats are interchangeable. Dogs are not. Hey. I know that was good. Okay, no, no, no. Mm -mm, no. If money was no object, I'd be looking for a new horse already. But money is an issue. I got two kids yeah, well, it's quite university, a right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're but both. If, they're both. Well, in university? Christy's about to. I had today off googling all the different options and stuff. My right. My daughter's coming home on. She's the teacher, right? Yeah. 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 yeah good for her. Also a teacher. Yeah. Good for her. Kids are gonna look at so oh. I'm getting back to order. So if money was not Mr. Chappelle, I will call the meeting back to order. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Yukar. I'm a land use planner with FOTEN Planning and Design. Uh, and I'm here presenting an application for zoning bylaw amendment at 60 Collingwood Street on behalf of John Hawes, uh, who is the owner. 
So the subject site is located in the Alwington neighborhood. It's located just west of Queen's University's main campus. So it faces the campus across Collingwood Street. Uh, it's in an area that's predominantly residential, uh, but as the property is located on Collingwood Street, it's kind of at the edge of the residential neighborhood where it interfaces with the university. So the lands to the north, south, and west of the site are residential, but across the street to the east is Queen's. Um, building heights in the area generally range from one to two and a half stories. There's the odd three-story kind of peppered throughout the neighborhood. Um, and it's in an area that's well served by public transit and public open space, uh, Breakwater Park, as we heard this evening, uh, the waterfront trail and transit routes both to the north on Union Street and to the south on King Street West. So our subject site is currently developed with a two-story building. Uh, it's contain it contains three units and has contained three units for an extended period of time. Uh, our, the applicant on this particular project acquired the property in 1992 and it had three units at that time. He thought they were permitted uh, when he acquired the property. Uh, the lot area is about 380 square meters and it has about 10 meters of frontage on uh, Collingwood Street. The property is also about 250 meters uh, north of the nearest uh, public transit stop, which is at the corner of Beverly and King. So this is the site as it is today. There is a two-story triplex on the property. Um, there's a, a unit on each floor. So there's a unit on the, at the two sort of large windows that you see, and then there's a smaller unit in the basement. Um, they, in looking back over the history of this particular building, we tried to determine whether or not this is, was a legal non-conforming use, whether it had been built um, uh, legally as a triplex, uh, and we weren't able to make that determination. The, the, the building records for this property, as discussed in the uh, staff report provided this evening, show that this was built as a duplex, so the building permit was pulled for a duplex. But the way the house is laid out, the way that, um, the, I mean, that certainly our, the, the applicant's perception when he acquired the property was that it, it has always been a, a triplex, it has always been a three unit building. Uh, and the way that the, base, the units are laid out suggests that as well. So although the building permit would have been for a two-story or a two-unit building, um, it's very possible that it was always built to be a three-unit building. Uh, from an official plan perspective, the property is designated residential, which allows a broad range of residential uh, uses, everything from single attached dwellings to uh, high-rise apartment buildings. Um, it, the proposed use conforms to the official plan, uh, the proposed use being a triplex, so as a permitted use, it, it's, it, it is permitted with, um, in this designation. The subject site is currently in the A zone, which is the one family and two family zone. Um, it, it's a zone that allows the, up to two units uh, dependent on the lot area. So the size of the lot is a factor in determining whether or not two units can be accommodated in the A zone. Uh, it also allows a range of community facilities I've listed some of, the, some of the performance standards, so the setbacks, height, and those kinds of standards that you see in the A zone, uh, just to give you some reference. So the purpose of this application this evening is to permit the three unit dwelling, so to permit it as a triplex. Um, it, we're asking to apply a site-specific B zone uh, to do that, which would describe performance standards of the existing building, and you'll see that there are some deviations from what the B zone allows, and a lot of that has a lot to do with the fact that this house was built under the A zone. It was built in the zone that was that predated the A zone, but a lot of those standards haven't changed very much. So this, the building was built, um, the, the built form that, that's there is very reflective of, of what the A zone permits, and that's why we're asking to, to amend some of those provisions, and you'll see that they're very close to what the A zone generally allows. By and large, it, it conforms to the A zone requirements, except for one particular side yard component. Um, as part of the development, we're also asking to provide the correct number of parking spaces. As a three unit building, it should have three parking spaces. It should provide 18 and a half square meters of amenity area per unit. Uh, so we're, we're showing how that's gonna work. Uh, there are balconies for the, second, the, the first floor and the second floor. They're, they have small balconies, and then there's a, a communal outdoor area at the rear that, that sort of fills the, the difference. I'll note as well in this presentation, um, we are asking for a recommendation this evening. We are asking, there is a combined uh, file. So um, what that means is that we had initially submitted an application for zoning bylaw amendment and working through the application with staff, we've changed some of the provisions that we're asking to amend uh, and provided a little bit more detail. So what I'll be presenting tonight is the performance standards and the application that's being recommended for approval. So the one that has gone through that process of being vetted by city staff. So all of the performance standards that I'm 
identifying in this presentation are ones that um, are in the staff report and the recommendation report. So there's some slight differences from what we had initially asked for uh, regarding uh, uh, barrier-free parking, for example, and, and amenity that, that are not reflected in the, um, the recommendations. So just showing the floor plans that are there, and these are the floor plans that are existing. They're not proposed to change. This is the way the building is. No changes are proposed to the build form whatsoever. The only change proposed to the site is that is to extend the driveway and provide three regular parking spaces, regular, three regular parking spaces based on the amended sizes that we've been using for the past number of years. So that's the reduced parking stall size of 2.6 meters by 5.2. So the site-specific zone that we're asking would be a B.566 zone. Um, this would have a, a, a reduction or a, a reduced front yard setback from six meters, which is what the B zone requires, down to 4.6. Uh, the minimum side yard would be reduced as with the minimum aggregate side yard. Uh, we're asking to increase the density slightly. The B zone has a maximum density of 69 units per net hectare. We're asking to increase that up to 79 uh, to allow three units. And that's a, fact, that's a function of the lot size and the unit count. Uh, we're also asking to amend those parking stall sizes down uh, to 5.2 by 2.6. And we're asking to ag allow a, a reduced aggregate amenity area requirement. So the overall amenity area requirement will be met. The zoning bylaw requires 18 and a half square meters per unit. That is exceeded. Um, but the zoning bylaw also says that when you're providing a communal space, a, an area that more than one tenant or resident is going to use, that that space has to be at least 54 square meters. Uh, so we're asking to reduce that a little bit down to 47 and a half. So that's the, the gist of the presentation, uh, where we, the application is compatible um, with the surrounding neighborhood. It's an existing building that's built form is not going to change. It represents an efficient use of, of land. Um, so it's consistent with the provincial policy statement. It conforms to the official plan in, in that it, in, both in terms of the permitted use uh, and in terms of compatibility. That, that compatibility of the building is not going to change. It's been there for since 1961, 62, uh, and that form isn't going to change. Um, and we're improving from a zoning perspective, in particular, the way that the needs of users are gonna be met. So right now, there's a tandem parking space kind of in the driveway that's beside the building. We're gonna be extending that and providing three uh, more functional parking spaces in the rear of the property. Um, so it's our opinion that this represents good land use planning, uh, and I encourage and welcome any comments from the committee and the public. Thank you. Thank you. All staff, if you, to make comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So pursuant to the requirements of the Planning Act, a notice of statutory public meeting was provided by advertisement in the form of a sign that was posted on the site um, 20 days in advance of this public meeting. Notices were sent by mail to 64 property owners within 120 meters of the subject property, and a courtesy notice was also placed in the Kingston Wig Standard on October 11th, 2019. Um, the committee will see one piece of public correspondence um, received since the writing of the staff report, and this is included in the addendum in front of you. Thank you. I will now turn to the committee if there are any questions from any committee members regarding this. Uh, yes, Councillor Chappelle and then Councillor Osanek. Rather than changing the zoning to B, why could we simply not just have a legal non-conforming triplex on, on zone A? So through you, Mr. Chair, the, the, a three unit building is not permitted on the subject site. Um, and because the triplex, because there's only a, a building permit for a duplex, which would have conformed to the zoning bylaw, uh, a three unit building is, is just not conforming. So it, it couldn't remain as a legal non-conforming use. It's, it's currently, as a three-unit building, it does not comply with the zoning bylaw, so it's not permitted. So in order to bring it into conformity and, and to compliance with the zoning bylaw, we have to amend the zone to allow three residential units on the site. And the reason that we're asking for a B zone, a three to six family dwelling zone, um, is because that zone exists and it allows three to six family units. So what the, one mechanism that that zone has to limit the total number of units is the density consideration. So the the density provision in that zone, the 69 units per net hectare, um, by amending that up to 79, we're allowing up to three units, but um, four, five, or six units could not be built on that property. They would not be legal because the lot size is not large enough to accommodate whatever density that would factor out to 80, 90, 120, whatever that, that number is. 
that makes sense. So how has this come forward as an issue? Has, was there a bylaw enforcement? Uh, like if it was running since 92, you said he purchased the property. Uh, and then is the remedy to get this rezoning versus removing the units? And how many actual bedrooms are in this complex? Sure. So I, I picked up two questions there, primarily how, how did this come to light? So that through you, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. So our client is looking to sell the property. Um, and in doing that, he was bringing it up, just doing some refreshments and bringing it up to code. Um, went to put in a fire separation for that third unit because he realized there wasn't one. Um, and when he went to pull the building permit, he found out that it wasn't actually compliant with the zoning bylaw. So um, that's the trigger in this case for uh, this zoning bylaw amendment application is that in order for him to legally obtain all of those building permits, he needs to comply with the zoning bylaw. Um, the second question, how many units or how many bedrooms are there? There are three bedrooms on the first and second floor and two bedrooms in the basement and that's not gonna change. Thank you, Councillor Osanek and then, Kel and then me. Thank you, Chair. Questions about parking. So right now with um, like the people that have been in the house, um, have there been three parking spots and they've been parking just in the existing driveway? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think this photo illustrates a little bit what's been happening. Um, that you can see just to the left of, of the building, just on the other side of that hedge. Brought my fancy laser pointer, so I'll show. So these two parking spaces are parked in the driveway and they're parked in a tandem arrangement. So the proposed improvements to the parking area will l basically mean that residents of the building don't have to park that way. This is the only way that residents can park currently uh, because of the width of the driveway. So by extending the, the, the driveway, uh, and providing those three parking spaces in the back, uh, just kind of tucked in against the back lot line. Um, residents won't have to uh, park in a tandem configuration at the front or beside the building. So I'll also note that one of the things that we're asking to do, uh, or at least that we're illustrating on this plan, is to provide one of the spaces at a, at a greater width than is the minimum bylaw requirement. So one of the spaces would be compliant with AODA from a width perspective. Uh, there's not quite enough lot width entirely to accommodate a proper access aisle next to that space, but the intent there is to provide room for um, just the opportunity that if there, are, if there were a resident to move in with um, accessibility needs, that they would have a little bit more flexibility in that parking space. Thank you, and since you have that picture up, can you please just show in you have your fancy laser pointer, which I love, um, which are the three spots you're proposing? One, two, three. Thank you. So this first space is the one that would be extra, the wider space, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and then the second and third space. So they're just kind of hooked into the back. Vehicles would pull in and park. And a little bit of a hammerhead is accommodated there, um, and a six meter width in that space is, is what you would see in a um, in a standard parking lot, like in a, 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 at the grocery store, for example, uh, it provides enough width for, for vehicles to back out and turn around with that little hammerhead. Thank you, and right now in the backyard, is it all grass in that back park where the three spots are going? Three, so we're, gonna, we're gonna lose grass? There is gonna be a loss of grass. There is, the backyard is entirely grass right now. There is a little mm -hmm. shed uh, back there that would have to be removed for this to happen. Uh, so that shed would be removed. Um, and then that grass would also be uh, paved over. Um, the, the, from a zoning perspective, the, the primary consideration is landscaped open space. That requirement is still met. Um, from a property standards perspective, uh, in paving that over, the applicant has a responsibility to ensure that negative stormwater impacts on the neighbors don't occur. Um, so that's something that we can work with the applicant on through that process, but there isn't a site plan process, for, for example, for them uh, to, for that to be in, enforced through through the planning department, it, it would be uh, something that the applicant would have to do to ensure as a, as a, they have a responsibility to do that. I believe the city has bylaws to that effect as well, um, but there the wouldn't be that design enforcement mechanism that you would typically see with a site plan application. So it's gonna be um, something that we work with the applicant on and make sure that that happens. Okay. And in our package, um, 50, in our package, because I don't know if you have the same picture, it shows the back of the building with the balconies. I don't know if you have that picture there, but it no. shows grass. And so I just wonder if you compare that picture on page 50 with what this is gonna look like, how much of that grass is gonna be left? 
So through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, the shed that's, that exists is right about here, but the balance of the property is all grass in the rear. So the, the um, grass along just to the rear of the building, which is going to be the functional amenity area, and then the little little buffers on the side and around the parking space, that's, what's gonna be, that's what would remain. So just to sound like Kurt, because he'll probably mention it, well, like I think there's not going to be much grass left. I think we would need like permeable parking, um, bricks, <laughs> that sort of thing, or else like I can see concerns here with stormwater runoff. And Thank through you, and through you, Mr. Chair, to that, if that's what the the to ensure that that doesn't happen, and and one of the ways that they would do that is is through ensuring proper grading of that paved area. So it would have to ensure that the the pavement. Um, that the stormwater runs off and, and the runoff is contained to the site and then it, the, the post-development flow, once the paved, paved area is, 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 is created, doesn't exceed what cur the current situation is. So they, they do have, that's a requirement that, uh, that property owners have to meet. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hutchison, did you have a question? I, I do. Um, um, ask uh, Councillor Chappelle's question in a different way. We were told, <laughs> not that it wasn't effective, but just, um, I mean, it's, it's clear what you want to do here and it's understandable. The, we just had an application which talked about switching to a B, right? One problem with you getting a B, it seems to me, is uh, that you would be in the three to six unit uh, land use description, okay? So what we were told in the last presentation that there are modified A's in the, in the neighborhood. So why not apply for a modified A? And through you, Mr. Chair, I think my answer is gonna have that of my colleague, which is a change in practice. So maybe 10 years ago, five, six years ago, before I started with FOTEN, 10, that was more common. It was the practice of taking an A zone and permitting three or four units and just keeping the performance standards the same as in the A zone. But a number of years ago, that practice changed and the, the, the driving factor there is that the city of Kingston has a zone for three to six family dwelling units. So that's the B zone. So it's more appropriate to bring a three to six family dwelling zone or to, to apply a three to six family dwelling zone to a project such as this one and then limit the number of units through other mechanisms. In this particular case, that primary mechanism is density, but factors such as parking and amenity also come into play. It wouldn't be possible to accommodate another parking space or to add, to provide the required amenity for an additional space without significantly altering the built form in the site in some way. That's not what's proposed here. And if an applicant wanted to do that in the future, they would have to go through this exact process and ensure that the proposed development is compatible. That's not what's presented this evening. This is this evening. It's about permitting what's there now and improving the situation by by bringing it into compliance with the zoning bylaw requirements. Another consideration is that the B zone has some appropriate standards for things like bicycle parking, which the A zone doesn't require. So one of the things, one of the changes that we've made to this project from what was originally proposed. Um, and you, it's, it, you can't really see the spaces, but tucked in underneath the balconies would be three bicycle parking spaces, and that's in, to bring it into, into compliance with the B zone. That's good explanation. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is an upgrade in zoning. We just had a situation where the question of density and form is concerned. We just heard that the change in the built form would be needed in order to increase the number of units on this really rather small, well, width-wise, for um, um, property. So, can Scaf comment on <laughs> the issue of why not, if we're trying to address those issues like we did in the last presentation, why wouldn't we just make them an A zone with modifications which would hold to the, the general neighborhood description? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think given 
the fact this has been raised in two applications in a row this evening. This is something we will take back and have a look at for further consideration. Um, neither my colleague or I have uh, been in the planning department for an amount of time that we can comment on the practice. So we're going to go back and do a little homework and uh, try to see uh, if we can come back with an answer and the best solution with that. Yeah, so I guess from my perspective and through you, Mr. Chair, as Ansultan said, the B zone does contemplate having having multiple units on a site. So it does; ha it has been amended over the years to include provisions for things like amenity space and bicycle parking and things like that, which in ensure that the site is functional for multiple units rather than a single family or a single family with a second unit. And so that is kind of my understanding of why we have shifted towards that direction rather than trying to reconfigure the A zone to address multiple units where it's intended to, to address more of a single family or a duplex type use. So at the center, this is compatibility in terms of land use in both descriptions. I'm just making that note. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I deputized vice chair? Take the chair, recognize you. Uh, questions in a little bit of history that's going to lead to a question. I don't want to be called out on that. Um, often we have because either the purchaser years ago didn't do their due diligence or they had a real estate agent that didn't do their job, uh, they find out, usually when they go to sell a, 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 a unit, that they're in non-compliance. And that's sometimes 15, 20 years later. And I've always willingly said, good, they're bringing it into compliance, fire code, and I support that application. But all of those applications in the past haven't been asking for a zoning change from an A to a B. And that's what gives me pause. Because frankly, I remember way back in 1992, Mayor Helen Cooper saying to me, good advice, the value isn't in the land, it's in the zoning. And the minute you upzone a property, the potential value of that property increases. And my concern is, as we, if we have more and more of these A zone, that in the past we've done spot zoning and allowed them to, to do some modest changes to, if the, once they become a B zone with three to six, and perhaps, I agree, this, this location wouldn't support six stories, but it might support four. Or somebody could purchase one of the adjoining properties and have a larger footprint and suddenly say, we want six stories, it's a B zone. And that gives me some pause. Uh, so, and... What's being asked for here is that our first order of business when we get to the actionable items is to approve this application. And frankly, I'd have no issues with it if it was still in the A zone and we're just trying to bring into compliance a non-compliant property that's been a triplex for decades. So. Uh, so I'd like staff to maybe address those concerns and I just want to remind this committee that when we get to that action item, if you share some of the uh, chairs never move motions, but if you share some of those same concerns I have and unless staff or the proponent can give us some compelling reasons why this is time sensitive, I would suggest that we defer the comprehensive plan, particularly because there's issues of uh, site plan issues that have come up. And so if we pass the comprehensive report the way it is now, it goes through exactly as, as proposed. So, 
But perhaps staff can speak to my cautionary tale. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, what, what the proponent is applying for is still a site-specific zone. So although the zone category contemplates those, those larger developments, this particular property will still be, um, will only have the entitlement that it currently has. D does that help at all? It does, except, uh, so, so I'm assuming that somehow within the agreement within the, the proposal on the deed, it would say a triplex. It wouldn't allow us giving them a B zone for them to come and ask for a, or to do a little bit of land uh, purchase and suddenly go for five or six stories. Is that, how can we assure that that isn't gonna happen? So the zoning would apply to this lot as is, as shown on the um, exhibit to the zoning, proposed zoning. Um, and so that site specific B zone would lock this lot essentially down to a triplex use because of the maximum density provisions. I would also add that if they were to propose four units in the future through consolidation or something like that, site plan would apply at that time, that would be triggered. Um, but if they were to, in the future, consolidate lands, the zoning would only apply to this portion of the land, and so the, the re land around it would still be zoned an A zone, and so they would be required to go through a rezoning process if they were changing the use. I hate that. I guess my only concern, again, and call me a cynic, is that uh, if you buy an A zone next to a B zone, we've had those kind of applications come here before. And we usually up zone. We usually agree, okay, this is a B zone, allows up to six stories. You've added to the footprint, so it's easier to get that A zone to a B zone. Do, do you follow that, Jake? Does that? Yeah, so I think I definitely can understand where you're coming from. And at that time, the land use compatibility print. Uh, policies of the official plan would be applied to determine if that use would be, as we've discussed through other applications here, um, appropriate in the neighborhood and the context. Could staff or the proponent answer my question, is this, is there a compelling reason why this would be time sensitive? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, the noted in, I think in, in responding to a question earlier, the applicant is trying to sell the property and is trying to, to divest himself of this. So there's some time sensitivity to that in trying to proceed with that transaction as quickly as possible. Um, he's already been delayed through this whole, this pr process of finding out that he wasn't in compliance with the zoning bylaw. Um, a deferral would defer delay that by another several weeks. Um, so he's expressed interest in proceeding. Yes, uh, I'll ask. For the chair back, it feels like I've never left it. I return it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Chappelle. Question: Your uh, chair, this really sort of highlights the aspect of the first proposal that was put on with the basement of non-compliance, and really, this is a situation where bylaw should have not permitted those units for being utilized, yet. For, from 92 to present, it, they've benefited with having non-compliance. So I, I'm really perplexed with this. And my question to staff would be is, uh, why would we have allowed it to permit to this? And why can't we just sell it as a duplex and be compliant? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Um, Essentially, we, we do enforcement for this type of issue based on complaints. So we don't proactively go out and inspect um, for the number of units in, in a building and whether that's permitted. Um, so, so as Yuko pointed out, the, this came to light because of a building permit application that was then flagged and we realized there was a, a planning issue with the property. So that's generally how these things kind of come to our attention. Um, I think, um, sorry, 
was the second part of your question. Um, I think in terms of the, the sort of whether this is in the A category with site-specific provisions to allow what's there, or whether it's in the B category with site-specific provisions to allow what's there, Either way, it is locked down in zoning. Um, so I think this is this is this whole kind of issue that we've seen through both of these applications is certainly something that we'll be working on through the new zoning bylaw project. And I'm I'm hoping it's something that we can address on sort of a citywide scale as opposed to on individual applications. Does that help? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question by Councillor Chappelle. I will say that the vast majority of our bylaws with perhaps the exception of property standards in the, in the student area, uh, in the university district. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, we don't have a lot of people driving around looking for, but we respond to complaints. And I've always supported the idea of if they're going to bring it up to code, and if it's been a legal uh, secondary suite, then let's help them make it legal. But that's, like I said, that's always been within the parameters of an A zone. And, and this is something of a new creature, going, going up, up zoning to a B to accomplish this. So. Through, through you, Mr. Thank Chair, you. may I just sure. provide just a comment on that? Um, the, there's, in our practice, we, we, we see these, I'm sure, not quite as often as planning committee, but quite often files of this nature where applicants are looking to legalize units. Um, in the past few years, we have seen a few more where triplexes of this nature that are being legalized are being brought into the B zone. Um, in other contexts, so in other neighborhoods, we've seen where um, a, a triplex that's existed for 40, 50 years is, is being legalized and it's being brought into the B zone. If it's any reassurance to this committee, this would not be the first time that that's happened um, in terms of legalizing a triplex. And I would echo um, the planning department's comments regarding the, um, the unit count, whether it's an A zone with site-specific provisions to allow three units or a B zone with site-specific provisions to limit it to three units. It's, it's a three unit maximum. So for example, if we had an, a, a client come to us and say, look, I bought this property, uh, it's zoned AX, what can I do with it? And we looked at the zoning and saw that it was permitted maximum of three units, we would, we would tell them that's, that's the most that you can do with that property as it is. And it, if they came to us with this particular site specific zone, a B zone with these particular provisions, we would say the same thing to them. You're permitted a maximum of three residential units. Thank you. I'm not sure that <laughs> takes away all my cynicism. Uh, so I'm going to open this up to members of the public. And again, there are microphones on both sides, if anybody would care to speak to it. Thank you. My name is Sandy Wood. I live at 54 Edgehill Street, and I'm also on the executive of the Sydney District Association. I feel that this is a repeat performance almost of the previous application, and an echo the councillor's comments that this is the slippery slope that we fear will happen. I, my, I'm trying to process. I'm not an expert on city zones and bylaws, but. Basically, my logic says this is something that's been non-conforming and operating the basement suite has been illegal for how many years, so now we're actually going to make it legal just because it has been. Why not enforce what it should have been? And I understand the urgency because obviously marketing a property as a triplex for sale is going to be more lucrative. And it's the same concerns that, and that we echoed on the previous application, I think, apply here. And I guess we don't have backyards and ecosystems anymore in our neighborhood. We just have paved parking lots, like Joni Mitchell said. So that I vehemently oppose moving to a zone B. Rather, just enforce it as a zone A. And if it's a duplex, it's a duplex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other member of the public? 
Yes. That's better. Um, I may have opened the can of worms here. Um, oh, sorry, Peter Rubens, corner of Collingwood and King. This house might even be a little bit closer than the uh, last applicant. Uh, is property. However, as I was about to say, uh, I may have opened a can of worms on this years ago when the uh, neighbor next to us had an illegal triplex. Um, he petitioned and uh, with a, uh, several modifications, uh, we decided that uh, yes, we can make this a legal triplex if you put in place certain provisions, one of them being Instead of turning the entire backyard into one giant uh, gravel parking lot, um, there'd be some amenity green space provided, and it was. Uh, I see with this, again, a loss of green space. I really decry that. Um, it, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, I see the, the problem that the present owner has, but I don't think we should be forced to rush into this simply because he wants to make a staggering amount of money or what have you on the sale of the property. So I think some um, careful reflection and consideration about uh, keeping the A-zone designation and uh, allowing a special treatment of the property in that designation would be uh, probably a very good idea. Lastly, I, want, I do want to say that in relation to what I I wasn't able to say in the previous application, there's an increased pressure that I see on uh, uh, rezoning and certainly site-specific zoning into B that I can see coming down the pipes. Um, the house on Beverly Street, um, the, the adjoining house or the next door, the house next door is a single family dwelling and uh, it's for sale. Uh, when it's sold, I can see the new owner making an application for a site-specific um, uh, B-zone application, and, and uh, then I can see this across the street on Beverly. I, I see this all around me, and I, I think we are on a slippery slope, as has already been mentioned. So I'd just like to finish with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further members of the public wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the questions and the public input so far. Yes, Frank Dixon, 45 Alfred, Department 2, K7K, 4J4. So many of my points have already been uh, discussed. And I do have a couple of other uh, new ones. Um, so in general, I, I don't live there. I don't have the neighborhood sensitivity. But in general, I would support this proposal whereas I oppose the previous one, because the footprint is, of the building is staying constant, and while there are several variances requested, it seems that none of them are, are major from my standpoint. But I do have two points. Um, I'm speaking on the first one as um, a retired geophysicist, so I've got some tech uh, cred there. I think the explanation given so far on the drainage is inadequate. And knowing the neighborhood a little bit, we're looking at a drainage going from the top of the screen towards the bottom of the screen based on the slope of the street there. And as we've heard, we're paving over the backyard. I think the applicant has to provide something more detailed and specific on the stormwater uh, aspect. Because we've heard from neighbors that this is a major issue. <coughs> Pardon me. Now my second question falls from some of the discussion on the committee and some staff information, as well as one of the previous public speakers. Now we have heard that this has been in effect, a legal non-conforming property since 1992. So that's 27 years. My question is this. Is it within the power of the city of Kingston, under some regulation, to fine the owner of this property 
let's say $100 per year for that legal non-conforming use over that period of time, right? If you don't file your taxes over a period of time, then you decide you want to file them, well, Revenue Canada may exact penalties. If you return a library book late, you have to pay a fine for it. So this seems to be a little bit of a scofflaw situation by the owner. So that's my question. I don't know the answer, but I think it's worth putting on record. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no further members of the public, auctioneering time. Going, going, gone. Uh, so uh, I will give staff and or the proponent an opportunity to address those questions or comments, and then we'll go back into the committee. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the, the comments received were um, in line with comments received from the committee members. I, I didn't hear any explicit questions per se. Um, I think we've, we've spoken at length about the A zone versus the B zone as, as a particular component. Um, I think this is this is one of those those places where I think I'm looking at this with with different eyes than than the public certainly. I'm looking at this with the eyes of a planner. I see a three unit, a zone that allows three units is the same whatever label you put on it. So from my perspective, the difference between a B and an A zone um, is is purely label, and it's it comes down to the performance standards tied to that zone. In this case, the B zone has more appropriate performance standards requiring amenity space and bicycle parking. Um, so I think I would make a strong case, at least, and I, I would think that we did in our, in our report, that the B zone is the right zone here because it has those standards for a, a triplex use, for a multifamily dwelling use. Uh, and the A zone is best suited to one and two family dwellings. Um, but I think that's certainly something that will will be in ongoing conversations with city staff on having heard what the committee has said tonight. I've heard this commentary at other public meetings um, that other colleagues of mine have had as well. So I, I do think that this is something that, that the planning department is gonna be working on um, and we'll be working with them on this moving forward on files. Um, I don't know if there's any other comments that the staff would like to address. Great. Um, uh, through you, Mr. Sir, thank you. Uh, you know, a couple of the points that were raised um, about the, the similarity of, of the two applications that we've, we've heard so far this evening. Um, yes, they're similar in the sense of the, the uh, amending zoning that they're seeking. However, I would say they're apples and oranges as well because one, we're looking at a brand new development, a knockdown of a house and building a completely new structure. The other one, we're recognizing an existing structure. Nothing's going to change on it. Um, the use has been there for, for 25 years, as I believe it has been pointed out. Uh, the owner, uh, because they are looking to sell, went in, did the right thing to get building permits, found out it was uh, illegal non-conforming. So in order to bring the... Uh, the existing dwellings up to fire and building code, they have to go through this process. Um, you can tie in health and safety issues to that. So they have that option to go through. If they decided not to do that, could the city say, fine, remove the basement units? We probably could, but legally I'm gonna guess we would have a very long and difficult battle to do that because they've been existing for 25 years. Uh, it would be costly and no control on the outcome. So that's why that route's normally not taken. Um, in terms of the question I think that was raised about uh, does the city have the ability to sort of back charge for the uh, lost revenue? I'm not aware of that. I can look into that, but I, I'm not aware of that uh, as a possibility. Um, I think that's that's about all I have to say unless uh, my colleagues have anything further. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I think I would just add one thing about kind of the similarity between the basement unit and one being an illegal existing unit for a long time and the other being open space that we're worried that could potentially be used as a unit. So the the concern that you, the technical concern that is uh, Utilities Kingston has with the um, previous application that we heard about basement flooding isn't the same as for this area. So in that case, that would, I mean, if they were in the future to apply 
to have a legalized unit, it would go through technical review, and if technical um, concerns were raised, that would be part of that discussion. This process has already gone through that technical review and been vetted by um, UK and our um, engineering and hydro staff, and no concerns were raised with the legalizing of this unit. Thank you. Um, we'll go back to the committee if anybody has any additional comments. It, yes, Councillor Hutchison, then well, Councillor. I just want to enforce, uh, I think, well, the public and the, uh, and the committee it said, like, the problem with illegal units is if you let them go, you're rewarding illegal behavior. They're going to realize, first of all, they received all the rents, right, for 27 years. Secondly, they uh, are going to realize the, uh, the enhanced sale price. I, I recognize what the staff member said here. I, I think that's the main reason we don't pursue it is because we think our legal position is relatively weak. Um, I think the chair made sort of semi-reference to that too. So maybe that's where we need to go. On the other hand, we also want them to be reported, right? We want to know they exist. Like in my district, I've, God knows, you know, we had that whole parking thing. Well, it seems to me that there's secondary units everywhere. Are they legal? It's really hard to tell, you know? Um, so this is about the only way we get to find out, oh, look at that, 27 years have been sitting right there, right? So I just, that's something, in addition to this, I, and I think the quandary for us, as I understand it here tonight, is um, is this going to be a zone A with m modifications or is it going to be a zone B with limits? The apprehension of the, of the committee is if we allow a B, it's much easier to go to more units. Whether you say it's, and I'm not holding you to this, but whether it's the, the staff is saying, it's a B, but it's got a, a limit on it, as per the, uh, the FOTEM per, uh, private person as well. When we have the pressures we have on us, not just politically, but as, as members of neighborhoods, it's really difficult to say, oh, that went up a, a scale on, uh, you know? So, <laughs> I don't know. I think that has to be addressed at some point, somehow. And, uh, you know, we've already more not to give you more work. Okay, so I don't know how that's going to happen. But I think the council, the committee would agree we need to get, start to get a grip on this. So we, we have to start it, right? The, we did Reddendale. You know, it's not that different in some ways. So anyway, I just wanted to emphasize that. We've got some a better answers for all of this. And uh, because things are going at uh, undermining integrity of neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, did any uh, staff want to comment on any of that? Sure. Thank you, and through you, Mr. I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of perspective on, on our enforcement activities when we do discover illegal units. Um, we, at times we discover them because bylaw enforcement has attended a property, um, or sometimes our fire department attends due to concerns. Sometimes it's property standards or yards. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a fire issue. Um, and so whenever that happens, we in planning are then looped into to that case, and then we can participate in, first of all, establishing whether all of the units were legal, which is more difficult than you would think sometimes. Um, and then we, from there, we determine sort of what the best course of action is. So if there is an ability under the current fra planning framework for the, the owner of the building to apply to legalize the unit, so basically if all of the technical concerns we think can be met, then we would recommend that they do that. Um, if we just know there's no chance um, because of health and safety issues, then we do have the ability to enforce against them and we can usually more through building code orders, but we can compel them to remove units. Um, and that, that happens too. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanic. Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. I had a question about the parking again. Do we have to have all three spots 
in the backyard taking up the green space? Or can we have it that it's just one spot and the other two cars park in the driveway and they're just going to have to maneuver around and then that way we can still have additional green space in the backyard? Through you, Mr. Chair. So functionally, we wouldn't typically support three parking spaces in a tandem situation where there's three units because any anytime someone wants to move their car, all people from the other units have to move their car. From a zoning perspective, the requirement here is to have 30% landscape open space and they exceed that at 32%. And so from a zoning perspective, right now they're meeting their parking requirements. There's no kind of mechanism for us to ask them to re request to reduce their parking requirements when they're already meeting the landscape open space requirements. Hmm. All right. Through you, Mr. Fine, if I may add as well, asks on this file is to reduce the parking stall size, sizes, sizes. Um, and one of the, the beneficial components of that, it, one is to bring it into compliance with the 30% landscape open space, but it's also to maximize the amount of green space that's remaining on the site. If the stall sizes were six meters long, um, th there would be a, obviously less landscape to open space, but a lot less green space because of those parking spaces. So if anything, this parking stall reduction helps to keep some green space that would otherwise be lost. Thank you. Um, would you care to take the chair, Madam Vice Chair? I do, I recognize you. Thank you. Uh, couple, um, this would be a question to staff and it might apply more so to the previous applicant for Beverly Street. But isn't it accurate that the Ford government, although the PPS now uh, has made secondary suites, which I support, uh, by right available, um, aren't they about to bring tertiary suites as a by right and therefore the people on Beverly who have uh, a basement that's almost apartment ready could go get a building permit once the tertiary uh, suite is made available. Is that accurate? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh two sort of separate issues there. Beverly Street, I'll remind you, is within a servicing constrained area due to the, the combined sewers. So in that location, it, it wouldn't be permitted. Um, we do know that the, the provincial government right now is talking about uh, tertiary units. Um, the, the evidence we have for that is actually in the draft provincial policy statement, where they've removed the reference to secondary units and they've replaced it with additional residential units. Um, and sort of anecdotally, we've heard that that, that indicates they'd like us to start allowing three. Um, the change that actually encouraged municipalities to legalize second units came through a Planning Act change. Um, so we haven't seen any specific changes that would, would immediately legalize three, but that could be coming in the, com in the next few months. Thank you. And I uh, address the question that was asked before about why we aren't dealing with illegal secondary suites. First, Almost all of our bylaws are complaint driven, unless a neighbor rats out a neighbor. Uh, we wouldn't be aware of it. And that's unfortunate because there's some health and safety and fire code issues around a lot of illegal secondary suites. Um, the most immediate way that we found out about illegal secondary suites was the serendipity of us going to a one bag limit and lots of people with one or two uh, illegal secondary or tertiary uh, illegal suites ended up phoning to complain because nobody was picking up their garbage anymore. Uh, so, so that was uh, a kind of interesting thing that came out of the one bag limit. Um, as far as Yes, we can find them, and yes, we've had a policy that if you commit to bringing it into code and you go for a, a zoning 
uh, an amendment to do so, that's okay. And I don't, my only complaint about that is we've got to say, you've got to do this within 18 months. Because the way it is now, we have some less than scrupulous developers or landlords that go, there were a couple in Williamsville that went a decade never answering questions about their active zoning file and therefore having it rented for a decade with no repercussions. And so we need, we need to address that probably sooner than the comprehensive zoning bylaw. So, thank you. Uh, any further questions? Uh, seeing none, I declare this portion closed and it will be coming up in the active file and we can take another kick at the can at that time if we need to. So, the final public meeting tonight is 2722 Highway 38. There's a problem with this drive. Oh, there it is. I think I got it. Yeah, okay. So hopefully this will be the easiest application you have to deal with tonight. Uh, <laughs> my name is Steve Haynes and I am the owner of the property at 2722 Highway 38. And we've owned the property since October of 2008. During that time, uh, we lived for the most part in a separate residence and we had this strictly as income property. And in fact, uh, on, you know, you're talking about illegal triplexes. For a while we had it as a triplex unbeknownst to us that it was illegal until we tried to sell it and get a letter from the city saying that it was legal, and they informed us it wasn't, so we had to take that third unit out. However, the property location, you can see on the uh, picture here from Google Earth, it's uh, Highway 38, just a little bit north of Unity Road. And it's a six acre property, and it actually has two houses on a single property. You can see just on the north side of the driveway is, we call it the barn house because it's a hip roof house. And then on the south side is a duplex that contains a four bedroom, two bathroom house or a unit and a one bedroom, one bathroom unit. I'm sorry, two bedroom, one bathroom unit. So we're four and a two. Now, uh, my understanding is this property is zoned as um, R130 which is, uh, and, and allows for a duplex. Now, we've run into a problem in that for five years now, my wife and I have been trying to sell this property, and it's virtually impossible to sell because the banks and financial institutions have all changed their policy Well, they will not give a mortgage on this kind of property. Uh, we had it sold five times, but every time it fell through due to financing, even to people with good records. Uh, in fact, uh, it's come to light that we may have to make some uh, investment in the property. And I asked about getting a second mortgage. My financial institution won't let me do that, just their bylaws or whatever. And I can't get a new mortgage because they said they won't give a mortgage to a property with two houses on it. So not only can I not sell it, but according to the financial institutions, I can't even really upgrade it. But what we're looking at doing is severing the property. And, in, and to do that, I have to have a zoning change to allow for the duplex. 
Now, like I said, my understanding is it's zoned already, rural residential, allowing for the duplex. Now, this property has, there's a picture of the single house. Um, it has been a duplex for many, many years. In fact, you can see it's impossible to sell. Um, this is a letter that I, we, we got from a neighbor. Uh, it was uh, legally uh, a declaration, a legal declaration. And if you notice the underlying uh, lines, it says, on or about 1966, an addition was made to one of the single family residents, changing it to a, uh, two rental apartments. And in fact, on the, the barn house that my wife and I are currently living in, you can see just inside the red lines there, you can still see the outline where they've patched the door for a second apartment in that barn house. But then what happened is the people decided, previous owners decided they wanted a bigger unit, a bigger apartment for uh, as a second unit. So they built the back half of the building uh, and that was approximately 1992 that they put that addition on. And as doing that, uh, my understanding is the city basically said, okay, you have to take the duplex off the one in order to apply it to the other. And so this unit now, instead of the barn house being the duplex, now this unit is the duplex and has been, like I say, since about 1992. What we're proposing to do is severing the property eventually. You can see basically the, the rough outline of what the lot lines are going to be. Um, but my understanding is we're not here to talk about a severance. We're here to talk about the zoning change. So for the zoning change, uh, again, now there's a the sketch as well for the severance. Um, what we were told we may have to do is also get a zoning change to allow for the uh, restricted frontage. As it is, it's roughly 40 meters across the front. And under the new proposal, we're gonna have to have one lot that's only about 15 meters and one that's about 35 meters. So that is, um, that is also part of this proposal. So uh, there's the, the uh, table of information that I was provided with. And beyond that, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. I wanna emphasize, nothing is changing. Nothing, we're not gonna add any other units. We're not gonna add any other traffic. Each building has its own septic and well and has had for many years without any issues. Nothing is changing except the dotted line on the survey. So, I'll leave you uh, at that and answer any questions. Thank you. And would whoever the staff planner wish to comment on this? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a notice of a statutory public meeting um, was provided by advertisement in the form of a sign posted on the subject property 20 days in advance of the public meeting. Uh, in addition, notices were sent uh, by mail to 13 property owners. Uh, within 120 meters of the subject property and a courtesy notice was also placed in the Kingston wig on October uh, 11th, 2019. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn to the committee if there are any questions or comments. Seeing none, that always augurs well. Uh, I will turn to the public. Are there any public comments that people would like to make? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation to uh, Mr. Haynes. Um, I'm in sympathy with the situation, um, and your explanation is logical. Um, so I really have no objections to it, but I just want to have a bit of a clarification. Um, you want to sever the property so that it will become conforming and you need a zoning change in order to do that and that's why you've come here to request from the committee. Is that the accurate um, rationale? 
that's my understanding of the way things work, is I had to get the zoning change first in order to be able to then proceed with the severance, so then we can actually sell it and somebody can get a mortgage on an individual property instead of the combined. Yes, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a situation where we had to get the zoning in place first in order to uh, uh, process the, the consent application. Uh, in processing the consent application, we have to ensure that the uh, severed and retained portions actually comply with zoning. So if we actually went ahead with the consent first, we would technically be creating a lot that doesn't comply with zoning. Uh, I can tell you that the consent, pro, or consent application has been uh, uh, submitted uh, and it's going to be in process uh, and there's going to be, uh, at, since the uh, zoning may be put in place, uh, we, can, uh, we can process that application as delegated authority. If we do have any uh, public uh, comments at that time, we would be bringing it forward to a, a committee of adjustment public meeting um, to address those matters. So, Thank you. Uh I jumped out of order. Uh, I'm assuming there's no other member of the public that wants to speak to this. Seeing none, thank you very much. So I will now declare, unless there's any comment from the committee, I'll declare this public meeting over and we'll now go into the business portion, uh, which We'll begin with, I'm calling Planning Committee meeting 21-2019 to order. Uh, approval of the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Chappelle and Councillor Hutchison. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, yes, uh, that should have been with the addendum. You all heard me say that, right? It was with the addendum. Uh, Confirmation of minutes from our October 3rd. Uh, we've all received them. Thank you. Councillor Osanic, Councillor Chappelle, all those in favor? Carried. Disclosure of pecuniary interests. Seeing none, uh, we have no delegations. We have no briefings. I will read the business, much briefer business statement. This portion of the meeting is open to the public. The city has initiated a new process in which members of the public will have the opportunity to speak for up to five minutes on comprehensive reports presented before the planning committee. Those wishing to provide oral comments at this meeting will be invited to do so. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaws pass, the, that person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. Our first uh, is item is 60 Collingwood when we, we, we've had that uh, public meeting just prior to this. Um, so the recommendation is before us and uh, it, it is recommending approval of, of the comprehensive report. Uh, I will open this. Oh, if, if staff have any comments they'd like to make on this file, otherwise I will open it up to the public if the public have any anything, and it should be something new, not something that was repeated at an earlier comment. So, so very briefly, Mr. Chair, I'm requesting a formal research effort be undertaken by staff directed by this committee on the case of fines for properties that are being legalized from Excuse me, that isn't currently a land use planning issue. That's a bylaw issue. And I've allowed some comments and some questions regarding that, but you should share that 
with with our uh, with with bylaw or our our planning director uh, making that request. Uh, very well. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll go back to the committee. Uh, looking for a mover or a seconder to put this on the floor. Thank you, Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Councillor Chappelle. If there are any questions or further comments that we haven't already made on this file or any action you would recommend. Yes, Councillor Chappelle. In this circumstance, I'm certainly going to lean on the expertise of staff, but I, there is certainly a great discomfort in how these properties go unchecked for 20 some years and our hand is basically forced. I don't want to uh, make a decision tonight that would do undo harm on the worst person who wishes to sell and liquidate the properties, but uh, we need to somehow do a better job at this. This is quite uh, you know, offensive to uh, residents and taxpayers, to be honest with you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments? on the Collingwood Street file? Yes. I th um, and I think I think staff got that like before, okay? So I'm not gonna la belabor it. But I'm gonna vote for this, and I think the committee will, but we're not all together happy to do it. Um, I'm not blaming staff or the people applying or anybody, but it, it's a bit of a mess. And is not you heard the consternation on the part of, uh, of the the public, and I think that they they um, the public isn't always right, but I think in this case they got some very valid points, right? So um, somehow we have to work out. It's not just the illegal part of it; it's whether the zoning is optimal. We're trying to protect this neighborhood, and if we vote for this. B, right? Then are we just be part of the, what was termed the slippery slope? <clears throat> On the other hand, um, as Councillor Chappelle said, the person wants to sell it. It's going to be legal now, eventually, uh, or soon. So it's a real quandary. And, it, and frankly, the illegal part is difficult enough. That's one section all by itself. The, the whole zoning thing and what we should be allowing is quite another. And I'm, I'm inclined, I would have preferred the A. I heard the argument from this planner, okay, which is a good argument. I just don't think it applies entire. It is not effective in a neighborhood situation or a city downtown city way. And uh, I think those of us wrote representing the downtown really feel that. But we don't have an answer, right? That's, that's why we hire you. <laughs> so that's it. I just, I, I just want to make sure that that's on some plate someplace, maybe over to the side, but someplace. Thank you. Councillor Sanek, did you have anything you wanted to say? Or? No? Could you take the chair? I take chair. OK, yes. I, I still have a concern about upzoning as a way to address this. Um, and I guess my one question, I know this is site specific, but we do a lot of things that are site specific that come back with people saying, well, this is, this is a precedent, you've done this before. And I'm still not convinced that up zoning to uh, up to a larger development envelope doesn't come back to haunt us in future because you can easily buy another one. And yes, to put the two properties together when it's an A and a B zone has to come through the planning committee but it's carrying a lot more mud if it comes back and one of the two is a bees, already a B zone. So uh, I have a concern about that. 
I uh, would support a deferral to try and get that addressed, but if, if the committee would prefer not to defer it, that's okay. I personally will be voting against this, realizing that if we vote this down, we have to have a huddle at the end and explain our reasons why. But I think the reasons are pretty specific. So, yes. With regard to a deferral, I want to ask a question of staff. Mr. Chair, through you. Yes. Okay. So, the, how long would it take to figure out how to bring this in as a modified A? Which apparently has been done before. Uh, yeah, so thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, it, it doesn't take long to figure out how to change the zoning category and the description. Um, what would take a long time is that the, the application would then need to come back to planning committee before it makes its way to council. So we would be looking at a two to three months delay. Mm -hmm. But we would another public meeting. Is that accurate? Um, the, the, the public meeting we've had. And so yeah. the, it would be the comprehensive report before us that would be getting amended right. or changed. With a different with a change. So I don't I don't think it would be, yeah, go ahead, James. Okay. I would Thank just you. like to mention that consideration has been given, has not been appeal period, which occurs after council makes a decision. I'm not a planner, so I can't speak exactly to how long that is, but I believe it's a month. Um, if a report came forward um, dealing with an A zone, um, the report before the committee would essentially no longer be valid and a new report would have to be prepared, so there is some timelines there, unless you were sort of just deferring it to give more per consideration to the matter. Perhaps the planners could speak to that because we have heard the public meeting and typically after a public meeting, a comprehensive report might come back three or four months later, and so we've given the applicant a public meeting. What we're deferring is the same day comprehensive report. So I'm not absolutely sure that there are time, that puts us in any time jeopardy. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I wouldn't say that it's, um, I, I'm not, the legislated timelines for making the decision aren't necessarily the issue here. I think the, the applicant's request to try and have this resolved sooner rather than later is more the factor. So having heard that and that the same time issues, uh, does anybody on the committee want to make any uh, recommendation? Yes. I'm going to ask, we heard you, okay? And we respect what you're saying, all of you, okay? <clears throat> you can see what our quandary is. We were told that the zo A zoning, um, how did I write it down? A zoning with modification is versus B zoning with limit, that's what I call it, are more or less the same thing, okay? We heard it from the private planner as well. But in our experience, <laughs> when these things come back, people use them as precedents, even if the professionals are sitting there saying, what precedent, right? Legally, in practical terms. But it does have an effect. And I think that's really what's bothering us. I mean, we've had... Uh, Ms. Agnew tell us numerous times every application is separate. I go to meetings with developers and they say, well, you know, right down there, they allowed 18 stories. Uh, yeah, I suppose I should say, so what's your next argument? But, you know, but it doesn't work that way, right? And when it gets counsel, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't politically work that way. So <clears throat> what we're concerned about here is that to protect this neighborhood, it's a one little small little 
Cusinaire block, right? Is that if we give it an A, if we sort of put you in that jackpot to do that, the, um, then at least we've done something, right? In the practical sense, recognizing it's not the end of the, you know, it's not an answer. So I think that describes where we're at, where we, how the committee feels. And so I'm going to ask you, if it's not too much trouble, do you see any real efficacy in making this an A with modification, as has been done before? Um, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. I think in case it really would just be, as Mr. Keene kind of referred to earlier, a semantic difference. Um, either way, the zoning permissions are locked down in terms of the number of units permitted here. Um, I think perhaps this issue is, is really best dealt with through the Central Kingston growth strategy, where we are looking at um, where infill can be permitted um, and what how we can sort of protect those stable residential neighborhoods as we call them in the official plan um, and how we can sort of deal with this as, a, as an entire neighborhood, um, on, a, on a neighborhood scale and for various neighborhoods across the central part of the city. Um, and it's certainly something that we're taking very seriously and that we can, we can sort of incorporate into that work. Um, because that work will be producing a greater level of detail in terms of the policy framework that will, will overlie these neighborhoods, I think we will have um, more of an ability as, of, as staff and, and as members of the committee to be able to evaluate applications with a, a little bit more of a detailed policy framework to give us clearer answers in terms of what's okay and what's not. Um, I think in this case we have an existing building that's not going anywhere and I think, I think that can be an important factor to consider. Thank you. So the main concern after that, and I'm fine with other people weighing in here, is, I'm just trying to be really clear, is 49 Beverly is going to come back? Now, we made no decision on that. That's a public meeting, and there's a report coming. And I want the vote 10 person to re recognize what I just said. No decision. But if it comes back with a B, right, which is the request, and I understand why they did it. It's all very rational. But the other side is also rational, so that doesn't help me. Right? So, <laughs> the, um, I'm going to be put in a really difficult position. It's not just one or, and all the others that came before. It's that one as well. And the ramifications are much greater. I don't know if you can even say anything, but if you've got something to say, I think now is the time. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments from the committee? I will just say, uh, maybe I am the most cynical person in the room, but <laughs> but I, I, I can't support going to a B zone because up zoning, I think, carries too many risks. And for that reason, I'm not lobbying anybody, for, but for that reason, I personally not going to vote for it. Yes, Councilor. It's a question I have for you, Mr. Chair. Um, are there currently, in the, that geography from Beverly to Collingwood, are there currently any existing B zone residents? So, Mr. Chair, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly where there are, but we did look kind of at the surrounding neighborhood when we were having this initial discussion um, when this went through pre-application. There is a site-specific B zone further north, I think on Collingwood on the opposite side of the street, closer to Union, and on the other side of Union, there are a couple site-specific B zones in those areas. There are also site-specific A zones in the area, so it's not consistent in terms of how it's been applied over the years. If I can, those weren't A zones that were 
transferred to B zones, but those were B zone construction applications. I, I can only remember the one. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't know the details off and off the top of my head. They're in the area that is generally zoned A zone and are site-specific B zones, but I haven't looked into the history of those files. Ms. Councillor Hutchison. I'm with the deferral. Have it, uh, um, they have the zoning. Um, I'm, I'm taking very seriously what the chair's concerns are, and so, I'm going to put uh, forward, if, it, if the deferral loses, then, you know, Excuse we know exactly me, what you're we're debating doing. the deferral. It's not on the floor till we get a seconder. Okay. Thank you, Councillor okay. Sanic. Time and place only. We can't speak to okay, it. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I need to ask staff when we get back. Good question. Um, through you, through you, Mr. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but um, because we have to give notice as per the Planning Act, um, we we wouldn't be able to get it onto the next planning committee meeting. So it would have to come back as a as a deferred item to the one after that. Um, yeah, so it would be November at the earliest. No, it would be the second meeting from now. Yes. Thank you. Um, in a, do you mean enough time for us to make changes to what the zoning is? Um, it's certainly possible. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> We're not trying to influence. <laughs> We're just so. Okay, okay. So I'm a little uneasy about that answer. I, Excuse me. There is. Uh, deferral, duly sure. moved and seconded, on the floor. Time has been spoken to. Place, I'm assuming, is right. Uh, and the direction you saw it was, is this, within this time frame, something that can be, that can be accommodated? And we've been told yes. So nothing else can be spoken to under our rules of order. We do have a seconder. Councillor Osanek. Okay, we'll take a recess to write a two-sentence uh, deferral motion. Yes. So, the motion to defer as moved by Councillor Hutchison as seconded by Councillor Osanek is to Defer the approval of the staff recommendation regarding 60 Collingwood Street um, to give further consideration to the comments received at the public meeting related to the zone classification to the first available meeting of the planning committee. And I'll just mention anecdotally that I believe 20 days notice is required um, before uh, this matter can come back. So that's why the date is sort of in flux. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, time, place, with some direction, all of that is copacetic. So I will call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. So we will move on to our final action item. And my apologies. It's been a good civics lesson, though, hasn't it? Uh, uh, 2722 Highway. 38, um, any further comments from staff or any questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, seeing none, I will uh, look for a mover and a shaker. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Osanek. Uh, no further comments, all those in favor? Carried, <laughs> thank you very much for your patience. Uh, Thank you. So we're moving to motions, none. Notices of motion, seeing none. Other business, 
None. Correspondence we received in the addendum. Uh, date and time of the next meeting, November 7th at 6.30. We'll all have recovered from Halloween by then. So, uh, adjournment. Quick, somebody. <laughs> 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 Councillor Chappelle, Councillor Hutchison, all those in favor? <laughs>